Hello, hello. Everybody hear me? You guys hear me in the back? Yeah. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, first, I'd like to thank Ion Nationals for providing us this space to be here today. And uh, I'd like to thank Yumi and Gen for um, all their work that they've done with uh, uh, nu in regards to uh, nuclear activism and radiation for since 1990. Um, they have speak uh, they are international speakers and uh, um, they moved here about three years ago. Right after March 11 earthquake. Yeah. Yeah. Right after the. Fukushima Daiichi accident. <laughs> so, um, uh, please welcome Yumi. Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you again for introducing us. So, my name is Yumi, and Yumi Kikuchi, and my Twitter, you may want to know to write it down because I will be the one in corner monitoring radiation every day. And if it's any higher or dangerous, I will post it on my Twitter. It's been 0 0.05 microsievert per hour. I'll be using that unit a lot because that's the uh, unit I use in Japan. Okay? Here in the United States, you use, you use different things. It's called a count per minute, CPM. And CPM is a unit you use, but in Japan, we use microsievert per hour. And this is my little Geiger counter. This is very, very inexpensive one, less than $100. So if you want to buy the good one, it's from Germany, Germany, and they cost about $500. And you may want to have one for your family, um, for your own protection from now on. Because radiation is coming this way, and as you know, you, it's already in the fish. It was in the air right after March 11, two years ago, two and a half, two years ago, and, and they came here, and it was monitored, it was found in milk, in Hamakua and um, Waimea, the area, all the milk was high radiation, so people don't know because uh, unless you look for that kind of information, um, you don't know. Because the industry has been very secretive, the nuclear industry in Japan and in the United States or any other part of the world, they are very secretive. There is a reason for that, because nuclear materials are used for weapons. So nuclear, nuclear industry is not just for energy, it's actually for weapons. And with the reactors, what they produce is plutonium. Plutonium is what we, they use for create bomb. And in Nagasaki of Japan, the bomb was made with plutonium. plutonium. And the, the Hiroshima bomb was made with uranium, uranium-235. So those nuclear reactors we use as commercial reactors now, it's called nuclear power plants. Do you know how many do you have? How many you have in the United States? Somebody? Okay, you give me the number. 104. 104, yes. 104, and lately actually it's 98. Two was shut down in the East Coast, and four was shut down recently. And thanks to Japanese accident, actually. <laughs> And because those four reactors were, was in the west coast for the San Onofre nuclear power plant, it was on, sitting on the new uh, earthquake fault. And earthquake fault has earthquakes, you know that? So, <laughs> so on top of earthquake fault, there's a nuclear power plant. In Japan, there are 54 nuclear power plants on top of earthquake fault. And Japan is a the size of much smaller than California. It's a small and very highly populated. We have 130 million people living in the size of a smaller than California country full of earthquake fault with 54 nuclear power plants. How do you feel? <laughs> it's quite insane to me. So I'm one of the people, many, uh, who has been telling my government electric company, please stop nuclear power plants and go to alternative energy, renewable energy, before the big earthquake hit the nuclear power plants. Because 
I know they do a good job. You know, our technology is very good. We are very diligent people, good workers, and high standard, intelligent, all of that. But you cannot fight against earthquake. Yeah, earthquake is something natural, and uh, you cannot present uh, prevent that. You cannot, you know, stop it, or it's you know, it's uh, nothing we could do about it. So when the earthquake happens and that hit nuclear power plants, it's pretty fatal. And that's what happened in the Fukushima Daiichi. So in today's talk, is I think I am speaking about uh, 30 minutes to speak about where we are at Fukushima and uh, Hawaii, how much we are affected. So as I said, for my own family safety, I monitor every day. This is a very cheap, inexpensive Geiger counter from Japan, and it only catch gamma ray. The gentleman there asked me to talk about gamma, alpha, beta. But there are three different lengths of radiation. Alpha is a very short length, be longer, beta, gamma goes farther. So usually, in Hiroshima, many people die from gamma ray. Okay? They hit, you know, they go through you. And you need to be inside a lead to protect yourself. And nobody in Japan had lead suits or anything at that time, so most of the people died in Hiroshima. Okay? So that's gamma ray. But today, nuclear power accident uh, has, you know, emitted all kinds of nuclear particles, including alpha particles, like plutonium. And this one can only monitor gamma ray. This one cannot monitor beta or alpha particles. Okay? So, but still, it tells you something. If I monitor every day, if today is 0 0.05 and tomorrow is 0 0.1, oh, something happened, you know, I will know. And in my house, in Nani, Nani Kailua, it's 0 0.05. It's been like that for two years. No change. So I'm still living happily, smiling, raising kids, raising family here. But when you come down to Ali Drive, do you know how high it is? It's like 0 0.14 to 0 0.17. It's been that way. It hasn't been changed. So somehow, shoreline is higher. I suspect something coming from the ocean. So, or it's naturally higher. Maybe if you go to very expensive hotels and made of marbles, marble, daiseki, marble has some very natural radiation. They pick up that. So, in Japan, there's a place called the Ginza, and there are many expensive boutiques, and they have all the buildings made of marble. Marble, they are there. Do you understand marbles? Yeah. Then um, this one goes high, very high. So marbles emit some kind of natural radiation, which is not harmful to you. It's not. So now I have to talk about man-made radiation and natural radiation. Natural radiation is not cumulative. All of us, through evolution, through the time, we survived through the natural radiation. That's why we're here. The, those creatures who couldn't survive this high radiation didn't survive, and they're not here anymore. But we humans and all other species survive those natural radiations, so it's, it's, okay. it's not dangerous. But the one I'm talking about is man-made ionized radiation, like cesium-134, cesium-137, that has half-life. You will hear a lot cesium-137, which has half-life of 30 years. Because that's the easiest radiation you can monitor, even this cheap Geiger count. So I, when I'm t turning this on, and they usually take 35 seconds to monitor the air radiation here in this room, they are picking up some cesium uh, gamma rays. Okay, so that's what it does. And uh, <clears throat> the man-made radiation from nuclear power plants is cumulative. You hear there are, maybe you didn't hear, there are 58 children in Fukushima now suffering from thyroid cancer. 58. And why thyroid cancer? Because at the beginning, right after the explosion of a nuclear power plant meltdown, 
what my government did was there's no meltdown. That's what they said on TV. Okay? And what they told the Fukushima people is stay in the house. They didn't ask them to evacuate. Stay in the house. That's what they did. So how long did it last? For two months, they hid the information about you know, truth, meltdown. So I'm one of the people from the day one, it's already melted down, evacuate. That's what I said. You can go back to my Twitter and you will find me saying that. And I was ridiculed and bashed and you know, all kinds of things. I'm telling the lie. But it, I wasn't. I was so sure it's already melted down because they lost all the power. When nuclear power plants lose power, they melt. As simple as that. Nuclear power plants need energy from outside. It's very ironic. <laughs> energy to keep cooling the nuclear power plants. It has to be cooled all the time. Otherwise, it gets too hot and it will melt and explode. It's natural, yeah? So the people in Fukushima has been exposed for a long time and they are even exposed today. There are 300,000 kids living in Fukushima as I speak. And why our government do not evacuate? They, they did something miraculous. They changed health standard, like safety standard. You, you have country have safety standard. My country has safety standard. It used to be one millisievel per year. Now it's you changed. I changed the unit, not micro. Okay, one millisievel per year. That's the unit. That's the safety standard before. March 11, 2011. After March 11, you know, it's too much radiation. It's much, it's higher, even in Tokyo, it's very high. So what they did is they changed the standard from one millisievel to what? What do you think? Five. Whatever five, okay. Five was Chernobyl evacuation zone. If it's five in Chernobyl, even the Russian government, it's not Russian, Soviet Union, <laughs> it's a communist country, yeah? You, you don't like them, yeah? So, so the Union, they evacuated everybody beyond five millisievel per year. Okay? Oh no, per year, five millisievel. So our government, what did they do? My government, my Japanese, you know, good country, I love my country, but uh, what they did is now the standard is 20 millisievel per year. It's safe. Okay? So every, uh, everywhere in Japan is safe, basically, except a very small area right around the nuclear power plants. There is a dead town, you know, uh, maybe 10 miles or 20 miles radius, is, uh, they have to evacuate. But all of Fukushima prefecture and surrounding prefectures, and like my prefecture is a two state away, Fukushima, Ibaragi, Chiba. Chiba is where I lived before March 11. And me and my husband again had an organic farm. And we are Japanese naturopath doctor. We, we teach natural medicine. And our medicine is what? Our medicine is food. We heal everything by food. Okay? Well, that's, what, that's my profession. I, I check your, you know, touch your body and read energy and what's lacking, we give. And that's how we heal. That's how Japanese heal people. So that's our profession. And we had all organic farm. We had rice, vegetables, mushrooms, fruits, and everything growing. It's still organic. We never, you know, spray anything, no chemical, but it's uh, maybe radioactive. I cannot call it organic once it's radiation, you know. I cannot feed people radioactive food and heal people. I can no, no longer do that in Japan. So we left the next day. I said time to go, and we went to Okinawa first. Okinawa is the farthest place we could go in Japan. We packed everything. Those two kids have to leave in two hours. They had to make decision in two hours. We are out of here. You pack what you can and left. And since then, they haven't been back. They haven't seen their friends. They haven't said goodbye to their schoolmates. These kids cried every day. Since they didn't speak any English. <coughs> Or so there are some tough times, yeah, for them. But I'm, I'm, I have no regret whatsoever. I'm so happy we did that because I hear now 58 kids are suffering from, from thyroid cancer. It's too many. 
thyroid cancer, as you are a medical practitioner, you, you may know this, it's a very rare disease. It doesn't happen in kids. Very rare. One per million. One per million, okay? <clears throat> and you know, some smart people can already calculate. There are 300,000 kids in Fukushima. 58 already thyroid cancer. So how many times higher rate? Too many. <laughs> yeah. So some yeah, smart people, mathematic people can calculate that. So 300,000 times, like three is per million, yeah? So 58 times three is like 180 times more. 180 times, roughly, yeah? More cancer rate than before, before and after March 11 uh, earthquake and nuclear explosion. So we are, I have to say this, this is the worst nuclear accident in the world and we don't know what to expect. That yet, um, we may be waiting the worst thing yet to happen because the, there are six reactors in Fukushima Daiichi. Six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And four of them got broken. Five and six, number five, number six reactor intact. But one, two, four, they exploded. One, two, three was in operation. Number four unit, it was not operating. Instead, those all the fuels were fuels are in the pool, cooling pool, when that happened. You think that's good or bad? <laughs> something bad or something good. Okay, so those three in operation exploded. That's bad enough. Number four, were, you know, all the fuel were in the pool. That means it's outside of the pressure containers. In Japan, we have this. You know, all the time from nuclear industry, it's nuclear power plant is so safe because it has five barriers, five barrier safety measures. One is boron around the nuclear, you know, actual nuclear plutonium uranium com, you know, pellets. There is a some um, container to contain that, and there is a another container called uh, that's how do you call it? Another one. So yeah, and then there's a pressure container, there's another one, and then there's a building. So five layers. So they taught, used to tell us it, it will never fail, never. But it, it failed like that on that day. Do you know why? It's because of the earthquake. The weakest point is those pipes, not those containers. Containers are pretty good, too, made strong, but those Pipes, cooling pipes, they have to cool the nuclear fuel constantly or it will melt. Okay? But those pipes are long and if when it shakes, it usually breaks and they lost the water. That's it. <laughs> That's what happened. When you lose cooling water, they can no longer cool the, the fuel and they go explode. Yeah? That's what happened. So it's really. Um, it was expecting. I, I, you know, if something like this happens, um, meltdown was expected. But our government and our media hid perfectly from all Japanese people for two months. For two months. So during that time, all the kids were exposed. As a result, now 58 kids are already suffering from thyroid cancer. So that's very, very sad. So what I do, Ken and I studied. Um, you have one of those cards I gave you today, the green card. It says, can I have one just to show? Yeah, yeah. It says, what we do is inviting the children of Fukushima to Hawaii Island to experience a healthy respite from radiation exposure. That's our mission statement. We've done two groups so far, and actually January 2nd, they left Kona back to Fukushima. They spent two weeks, and some of you here has helped me to raise money through Zumba parties and auctions and all kinds of things. So I'm still raising money today, um, selling those buttons, um, and you can help us to bring the next group to the corner. So I want to show you, um, because my English is very limited, I always speak in Japanese. I rarely speak in English to the public. Um, my profession is I speak and I write in Japanese, unfortunately. I do this in English because I don't think you understand Japanese. <laughs> and now I have a very short video which is in English and uh, hopefully you get 
this in 10 minutes. partial meltdowns, don't worry about it. Now we know it was 100% core melt in all three reactors. Um, Japan is by orders of magnitude many times worse than Chernobyl. Never in my life did I think that six nuclear reactors would be at risk. Well, puff goes like the little dust boy. All of a sudden we have cracks in the dike. You put a figure here, you put a figure there. And all of a sudden new leaks start to occur and they're overwhelmed, literally making it up as they go along. We're in totally uncharted territories. You get any nuclear engineering book, look at the last chapter, and this scenario is not contained in the last chapter of any nuclear engineering textbook on the planet Earth. So they're making it up as they go along and we are the guinea pigs for this science experiment that's taking place. All radiation is damaging. It's cumulative. Each dose you get adds to your risk of getting cancer. Copy my Within days of the Fukushima Daiichi catastrophe beginning, we were getting uh, fallout coming down in rain in the United States, not in insignificant quantities. And also, of course, the, uh, the seafood, um, not only does the ocean's currents bring the radioactivity this way, but also uh, the sea life itself, the bluefin tuna, uh, migrated from Japan to North America and carried the radioactive cesium in its flesh over here. Wow, not a good time to be eating tuna. The food chain <laughs> remains contaminated for hundreds or thousands of years and we'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia I think two to five years from now. And then solid cancers will start appearing um, 15 to 60, 70 years later. So the ace up the sleeve is, of the nuclear industry is the incubation time for cancer. It takes a long time for cancers to develop once you have inhaled or been exposed to these radioactive elements. And no cancer identifies its origin. And so there is already a level of cancer in society, but it's going to increase dramatically. The problem is not really under control. It will not be under control for, it's estimated to be 40 and 100 years from now. There's no way to clean it up. They say 40 years, but they can't clean it up. They can't. And the site's still unstable and vulnerable to natural disasters. If there is another earthquake, a serious one, six, seven, eight or nine magnitude, that would rattle all these 10, 1,060 tanks. It would rattle the, the, the damaged cores, spent fuel, whose who structures have already weakened. Yes. That's a potential, very, very serious threat. Approximately 300 tons of water was filtering through the site until early this month, becoming laced with radioactive materials and then seeping into the sea. Another factor is the ever-increasing amount of water accumulating inside damaged infrastructure. Once it makes its way into reactor buildings, it mixes with radioactive isotopes for months, TEPCO workers have been pumping up 400 tons of water every day and storing it in tanks on site. There's 1,060 tanks, stainless steel water tanks, that are holding the water which they keep pumping into the, into the uh, damaged reactors and the uh, uh, spent fuel storage pools. From the air, the scale of the problems at Fukushima become clear. The growing mass of storage tanks now dwarfs the plant itself. More than a million tons of highly radioactive water is now stored here. But the tanks have been hastily built. They're made of steel plates, bolted together, rather than welded. Last week, workers detected a major leak in one of those tanks. About 300 tons of water escaped, 
releasing several quadrillion becquerels of radioactive particles. Experts have often pointed out how vulnerable they are to damage. The tanks, though, have been put together very quickly. There's no guarantee they'll last. Their seals are made of rubber and the joints and, and bolts are corroding. And they may last not more than five years. So the tank farm has grown dramatically and it's on the hill. Of course, the problem is because it's on the hill, the um, water flows down. And if there's an earthquake, all of these pipes are held together with plastic piping. Exactly. Not much different than what you've got on a swimming pool. So the plastic pipe will, will, will um, snap and that water will just run right down that roadway directly into the ocean. And how long the contamination has been leaking into the water? Very likely since the uh, explosions and the meltdown at uh, Fukushima Daiichi in March of uh, 2011. Wow, that, that is quite a long time. Now, how much and what sort of radiation is leaking into the Pacific? I know there's all different types, so if you can explain that right. in a little detail. Well, clearly what we've seen now is the movement of radioactive hydrogen, tritium, uh, which uh, is a uh, mobile uh, radioactive isotope, but clearly um, radioactive cesium-134, 137, strontium-90. We're seeing a full range of radioactive contaminants now moving, which indicate that uh, the damaged cores of these reactors, the meltdowns themselves, uh, have, are now contributing to the contamination of the Pacific Ocean and groundwater that's moving at about a, a rate of a 300 to 400 gal uh, metric tons uh, per day. So the radiation has been leaking into the water and polluting the fish continuously for the last two years. Radioactive iodine 129, its half life is 17 million years, plus strontium, plus cesium, plus tritium, and I could go on and on and on. If it gets into the sea, the algae concentrated hundreds of times, then the crustaceans concentrated hundreds of times, and the little fish, then the big fish, the nuts. Nice because we stand on the apex of the food chain. You can't taste these radioactive elements, you can't see them, and you can't smell them. They're silent. This graphic shows the gradual contamination of the Pacific Ocean due to leaks of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. The simulation, which was run by a German Marine Research Institute, shows the entire Pacific waters being polluted by radioactive water in just six years. The fuel core of Unit 4 of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. More than 1,500 fuel rods sit in a damaged storage pool 30 meters above ground. Yeah, this, yeah, this the marine activity within the, in the rods themselves is about 14,000 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. We are dealing with diabolical energy. Mm -hmm. E equals mc squared. It's the energy that blows up nuclear bombs. Einstein said, nuclear power is a hell of a way to boil water. They need to remove those fuel rods from the pool because if there's another earthquake, building four would go down probably, and all those fuel rods would be exposed to the air and they would burn, and they would release 10 times more radiation or cesium than was released at Chernobyl. Huge amount and pollute much of the land. square, there's a fuel rod like this. We're in a nuclear crisis at the moment. If there's another earthquake and building four collapses, which contains the cooling pool with fresh fuel, I'm going to evacuate my family from Boston. So they put a crane on top of that building, which is shaky anyway. And they're going to lift the fuel assemblies up one by one with the crane and it will be done manually. Normally, those rods are removed by computer control with millimetres to spare. It's a very delicate operation. The fuel rods must be kept submerged and must not touch each other or break. Nuclear experts warn any mishaps could cause an explosion many times worse than that one here in March 2011. Because if several rods touch each other, you could reach criticality and the whole fuel pool could go critical or if the rods break, if they're being lifted out, large amounts of radiation would escape from the rods and the area would have to be evacuated, meaning that the area is evacuated 
the continuous operation of cooling five bit fuel tools and three melted cores would stop. Need I go on? Yeah, so unit number four, pull touch, and yeah, this one is the most dangerous one. And, well, <laughs> that's uh, what I could show in English. This is the best one I found in English, and there's more information in Japanese, of course, because we have, I have many colleagues in Japan working on this issue every day, and I get the news from Japan, so I constantly will write a Twitter. It's mostly in Japanese. I do this mostly for Japanese people. But I, if I see any high mark of radiation in corner, I will write that in English and Japanese. So you will see that's on my Twitter. You, you want to keep that Twitter, following the Twitter, just to get that. And if it's unchanged, 0 0.05 micro sievert power, I don't write anything, OK? And uh, what do I do now? So people ask me question, uh, can I eat fish? Do I eat the fish? Yes, I still do. Do I eat the fish if I were pregnant? No. If I were pregnant, I wouldn't eat the fish. Why? Because the fetus, baby in the womb, is the ones who get most damage from radiation. They're the ones. And do I feed the fish to girl, girls, like my daughter? I, I wouldn't want to. There's a difference between boy and girl. Girl has all the eggs already. Their eggs are already inside their body. They carry that all their life. And that's what they will use when they get pregnant or, you know. So those eggs are in their body. Boys are different. They make their, you know, their sperm as it goes, yeah. <laughs> so there are difference between men and women. So uh, you would like to take extra caution for girls. Um, if I were young, like 20 years and younger, anybody 20 years and younger here? Those should be the ones who be listening to me, actually. Because as you age, you get less effect, actually. <laughs> If you're over 40, I, I'm over 40, so I, I eat anything. I eat, I eat anything, but I, I still would like to keep my body healthy, so I would watch, but uh, I, I still eat fish. I still eat lots of things that people say it has radiation. I still do. I still go to Japan. And I may die of cancer, I don't know. But I try not to, by using my knowledge of Japanese medicine which I teach and I practice, so I hope not. But um, um, for children, you have to be really extra careful for what to feed the children. And what you want to feed, uh, I would, I'm feeding to my children, is uh, apple. Apple. Apple a day in the morning, I mean, stay away the doctor, yeah? But you have some saying about apples, yeah? So apple in the morning, uh, especially now, the apple pectin, has a way they kind of suck radiation and get rid of your body. They do that. And they use apple pectin and apple cod, lots of, you know, the, those fruits in Ukraine and the uh, Chernobyl area to feed that to kids and they had a remarkable result. So I have, you know, we have apples in Japan and I'm sure you have apples in the United States and if you can get organic apple from Island Naturals, buy one and give one a day to child. I do that. I've been doing that. So my kids kind of like apples now because I, they've been used to eating that for years now. Another thing I want to feed the kids, uh, uh, anything green, anything. The darker, the better. But many kids do not like vegetable, like my son. They hate the salad. Yeah, mom, I, I'm eating salad every day. I no no salad today. Give me the least salad. You know, he tried to avoid the salad. If you have that kind of boy or girl, give something like this. Okay, this is good. Spirulina from Hawaii. This is good. 
So give lots of chlorophyll. Why? Because they detox. They detox. They have power. And all those things, um, Ben will be talking more nutrition things later. That's a good news. We could there's something we could do. But me coming from Japan, I'd like to share what we had after Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb. The group of people in Japan who lived and there was a hospital at the epicenter, uh, one mile, one mile from the epicenter. Most of the people, you know, were incinerated and died. But this hospital was made of concrete, and they survived. And at that time, we didn't know anything about radiation. It's a first bomb. We didn't know about nuclear bomb. Okay. So that hospital kept operation, and people were coming to that hospital to be treated. Okay. One mile in the epicenter. And they didn't have any medicine, of course. It's, everything is burned. All they had was miso. Miso, you know miso? Miso. And they fed miso and brown rice with seaweed and wakame. Wakame is another seaweed. And umeboshi they had. And they all survived. All of them. All of them. None of them died. And so there's something amazing about miso. It's real miso. Not the instant miso you buy, you know? <laughs> it has to be real. Live culture miso with lots of enzyme. That can help you. So be friendly with miso. It's a quiet taste. You may not like it, but get to like it. It really protects you. If you don't like miso, you can eat like kombucha or you can eat um, like um, zawa crown. Anything fermented is good for you. And I eat more organic raw than before now. After March 11, you need more enzyme than before. To fight against cancer and leukemia, you need more enzyme. The, with the age, I said, as you age, you get less effect from radiation, but as you age, you lose your internal enzymes. Okay? So if you're over 40, you need more enzyme from the food. That's another thing. When you are 20 years old, the enzyme level inside your body, metabolic enzyme and shoka uh, koso. How do you say shoka koso? The digestive enzyme. They are peaking at the age of 19 to 20 years old. Anybody over 20 years old here? Yeah, so you already picked up, okay? So your enzyme in the body is less. So you need more from outside. So after much of them eating more raw, fermented, organic ever before, than ever before. And am I healthy? Yes, I am. I'm very healthy and you may know I have lots of energy, right? I dance, yeah? I dance very strong and I don't get tired. So that's another thing by eating organic, raw, fermented, lots of enzyme food, keeps you very strong and vital. So that's something all of us should be doing and we have a dream about this island. This island should be certified organic as an island. And this island should be certified 100% renew renewable energy. We could do that. If we combine our power together, our will, and put the money in the right place, we could do that. Let's, let's make that happen so that people can come to Hawaii to heal. Like I am doing that with my I mean, Fukushima kids. You know, they come here, spend two weeks or two, one month. They get, they get much better. Their energy level goes up. They are more smiling, they're happier, and much better. So. But it's not just for Fukushima now, you know, as you saw this video, <laughs> to be global issue, we'll be dealing with this globally, and unfortunately we'll be dealing with uh, living in higher radiation from now. More radiation, more pesticides, more chemicals, you know, it's very hard to stay healthy in this society. It's really toxic. But we can, this is the island, we can make this island toxic free, and 100% renewable energy, we could. It's all the people, you know, it's, it's our choice. And uh, we could do this for the rest of the world. Because we are isolated from the anywhere, this pollution from industry, we could do so. So that I have a big dream with that. So here, the band and I have a big, share the same dream and we want to make this happen while we are still alive. And I want to uh, here introduce my husband again, who is my teacher of Japanese traditional medicine. Uh, I've learned all of this medicine, it's very ancient medicine from Japan and it really works and it doesn't cost you any money except you pay us yeah, <laughs> for treatment but uh, actually you don't have to buy pills and uh, supplements and no, it's just food and simple 
um, method that we may be sharing a little bit. How much time do I have? Do I speak too long? What time is it now? I want to watch time. I study 2.15. Five minutes to three. Okay, so you have uh, three, three fifteens. Yeah, ten minutes. Okay, yeah. I didn't speak too long. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Yeah, just three fifteen. Yeah. So again, Morita. Hi. How are you? Hello. I know you are very concerned about the radiation effect on health. But first, we have to know our body, our system, how it works. And in Oriental medicine, we think we have four basic fundamental internal organs which controls all other functions. Okay. And I want you to remember this, because I don't think you have ever heard this. First, Right here, right here. <coughs> yes, I may uh, recognize this as the fourth chakra. We have thymus. Thymus gland is one of the most essential, important organs. Have you ever heard of thymus gland? Do you know what it does? It's immune system. Very yes. good. <coughs> Yay! So, <coughs> when we check our client, this is the first organ we check because it indicates the level of your health, in other words, your life force, how much your healing power you have. So very important, if you have high thymus function, you don't have any worry. Okay? That means you have a full power to control your body. You may have some, you know, cold or flu water, but that means you can heal yourself. You have a full healing power. And secondly, what is this? Largest internal, internal organ you have? Liver. Liver. And what liver does? Purifies. Filter. Filter? No. Yes. That's good. Liver is like a processing plan of your nutrition. Whatever you take, you, you eat, the nutrition doesn't go into your bloodstream directly. We can't use as they are. It has to be processed so that we can use in the form into whatever amino acid or proteins. And, and optimum form. So it's a processing plan. Yes, it uh, has a <clears throat> uh, cleansing, uh, detoxing, but only for urine. It creates urea. Okay? When we talk about toxic stuff, a substance, I think you will immediately think pesticides, all those ingredients, uh, toxic uh, man-made chemicals and those, right? Liver can't process those. Liver doesn't process that kind of human-made chemicals or toxic uh, compound chemicals. Then, which organ? Okay. Okay. Take your left left hand and touch your the end of the elbow, just side. Left side. Yeah. And with the thumb, push. Yeah. Where your elbow touches. Oh, of course, it's you know varies with individual. Some people have longer arms, yeah. <laughs> How do you feel? Like I eat too much sugar. <laughs> <laughs> this is it's, it's being considered as a mystery, mystic order, because we we didn't know. 
what it's for. So when the surgeon do a surgery, they usually find this is inflammated and they take it out for service. This is spleen. And in Eastern medicine, spleen has a very important play an important role because this toxifies what we call those toxins, detoxification. And it also it controls our hormone system. It controls our <coughs> thyroid and reproductive system. And it controls our lymph flow. So already you understand how important it is. Okay? And the trouble is this is spleen is very weak to chemicals and sugar. So that's why we emphasize that, that whatever you eat is very essential whenever the radiation is involved. <clears throat> and lastly, there's a last lid. We have 12 lips. This is 12 lip, which ends in between somehow because we are still on the, in the evolution process. This is kidneys because we have two. Okay? And if you touch it, you may feel uncomfortable or maybe you feel pain because most of people kidneys have inflammated, inflammation problem. Kidney is a filter of your bloodstream. It's very important. Okay? <clears throat> so, what I'm s trying to say is what you eat creates you, of course. So, it depends what you eat. It means a lot. And I think you may discuss a little bit about the green. Why are all the plants are green? Chlorophyll, and why the plants, all the plants create, produce chlorophyll? Why? What's the main purpose? Make blood. Make blood. Make blood. Okay, yeah, mentally by oxygen. Well, I tell you, the sun is, of course, is a very beneficial energy, but not always. Because if you expose yourself in the sun, what will happen? Skin. Skin get burns. And if you keep exposing, you get cancer, right? Now why not the plants? Plants is the same DNA as, as we do. Because they produce chlorophyll to protect themselves, they keep detoxifying the radiation, lethal radiation, okay? Ultraviolet, right, and x-rays on the radiation. It's in the sun, but fortunately we have a barrier surrounding the earth, so they uh, reduce the amount, but still it reaches to the surface of the earth. But animals, like we can walk, we can hide ourselves in the cave or the, the shed of trees, but not the plants and trees. That's why they produce this chlorophyll. And that's the why, that's the main reason why we try to tell you eat greens. Lions, now they eat meat, but what they eat first is they eat the guts of the you know horses or whatever. They are in our our bivious, herbivorous. Yeah, because in the guts there's a lots of chlorophyll, so they take this and lions, and they use that the, the chlorophyll and detoxify. So that's the main reason why the vegetarian is so important. Okay? And here it is. Okay? Need to be organic though. So uh, now we have to do some uh, promotional this island nacho. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of stuff, perfect raw or any kind of green group you like work. Red, green. I like this one. This is my favorite, and this one also. Yeah, yeah, it's a question. 
Yes? yes. Is there a preferred way to get the most out of your greens? I'm assuming that having something fresh is the best way to do it. Yes. But pulverizing it or juicing it or just throwing it whole into a smoothie, I, I, I feel like having a, something straight out of the ground would be the best way to take it as opposed to something that's been processed. The so, best I think, I think, is take it and eat it. Yeah, yeah that's best. But not everybody can do that. So next best is like juicing, and the next maybe the smoothie. Yeah, but if you are healthy, now any of those works for you. And yeah, but if you are really very ill, I I always you know recommend juicing for the very ill patient. But once you are healthy and your digestive system is okay, smoothie can take more nutrition. Yeah. So each person is different. So. That answer your question? Yes. Any, any question? I, I wanted to add because I wanted to answer, I mean, he requested me to speak more on radiation things. I want to touch on a little bit about radiation where it accumulates in organs. Yeah. Like um, Helen Cut, most of the people in the video, they are my friend. I've been working with them for like 20 years now. Like Annie, Helen Caldico, she is a pediatrician from Australia. And she found with radiation so many cancer of child, child cancer. So she, she became against red nuclear power plants. Anyway, so she and I uh, traveled around the world trying to stop nuclear power plants. So she, and, um, she Annie Gunderson, and Paul Gunter, everybody I knew, actually. Anyway, she touched on where it goes. The iodine has eight days half-life. When the half-life is shorter, you think it's good, yeah? Half-life, eight days, means 10 times of half-life, it almost become nothing. So iodine, 130, becomes zero after 80 days. Like three months later, it almost becomes zero. Is that good news? <laughs> Some people say it's good news, but actually, when the half-life is short, it emits more power. Energy, more energy. So those kids in Fukushima exposed, you know, to iodine 130, and uh, it goes to thyroid. Thyroid is hungry for iodine, and they don't recognize between radioactive iodine and the natural iodine. So important thing is to keep your thyroid always full of natural iodine. <coughs> natural iodine, where do you get that from? Like kelp powder? Island Natural has one, you know, try to get non-radioactive kelp, okay? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> uh, anyway, but there's a iod natural iodine pill, you can also buy that. Yes? How do you get non-radioactive kelp? It's very hard nowadays, yeah. I, I don't buy from Japan. <laughs> and it's very hard question to answer, actually. Maybe Atlantic? Um, we don't really know. Some part of eastern part of Japan still clean, no radiation there. The Hokkaido, that the other side, not this side. That's maybe, east, so west maybe, side. Maybe some of you have uh, answer. No. Yeah. There is uh, a person that lives on the Atlantic coast, mm -hmm. and he collects all of his own seaweed. Okay. And it is excellent. I've been using it ever since that. Is that enough to feed the humanity? Um, well, <laughs> or a ton of people, yes. We have some here, right here in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so, yes, I, I'd be happy to share that information. Okay, great. So, uh, make sure you eat like more seaweed than before, like nori, or hijiki, wakame, kelp. Or um, oh, 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 yeah. no. lim. Lim. How radioactive, I don't know. That's another thing we have to ask our government officials, local government, legislation, we need to pass legislation to monitor those seafood and sea lives, how radioactive it is. We need to do that, yes? Unfortunately, they are using various types of monitoring equipment that does not do the alpha, beta, and the gamma. Yeah, that's more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Type. So it's not giving you the full information. I see, but still, even just the gamma ray, you know, even just cesium, that's very important information. We should, you know, ask for that. Yes, gentlemen? Yes, uh, 
the uh, algae that's grown in some lakes, yeah. is that a good replacement for the kelp? Yes, probably. Yeah. Yeah, if it's not radioactive. The United States has lots of um, nuclear facilities, and they always use water, and they always leak, and they don't tell you about it. So it's, uh, even if it's a fresh water and it seems to be clean, you don't know. So that's another thing. It would also matter because uh, if the lakes don't have iodine in it, then the algaes wouldn't have a large iodine. Amount of iodine. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I see. So I am eating more sea. Like today, lunch was nori maki, seaweed nori. You know nori maki, nori raw. I use that a lot for kids, you know, so that they eat some kind of seaweed every day. My child has been complaining. My snack was always kombu kelp as a child. I, that's what I gave to my daughter and my son as a snack <laughs> instead of candies. That's what, how they grow and she complains. I'm miserable and I didn't eat all the candies like these kids eat. But you know, <laughs> she's healthy. <laughs> so iodine, uh, another thing, let me finish what I, oh, okay, let me finish. So iodine goes to here, cesium, where do they go? <coughs> cesium go to muscles, muscles, yeah? But which muscle is more damaging? Heart muscles. Heart muscle will not be replaced. Only 1% of heart muscle will be reproduced. A year. A year, 1%. 99% stay the same, okay? This muscle, yes. So they go to muscles and uh, the damage will happen in the heart. So in Japan, there's more and more heart attacks. I know we are not, you know, o o no, obesity is not the problem in Japan. We are fit people. We Japanese diet is very healthy, but they just they just die from heart attack now. And I suspect it's cesium 137. Okay, strontium 90. Where did they go? Oh. The half life 29. It goes to bones. Okay, bones. When they go to the bones, all kinds of problems. You know, like leukemia, and they have bone cancers. And very hard to get rid of. And plutonium, where do they go? They go to the lung. Lung cancer, it's mostly attributed to plutonium, 239. So that has half-life of 24,000 years. So that one is hard to get rid of. So plutonium is the worst one, I think. And strontium is another, I don't like that. I don't like cesium. <laughs> but anyway. And it all goes to all those organs. And you want to study the study of uh, Yuli Bandajewski, which didn't show up on this video. That's another person. Yuli Bandajewski, can you spell it? I cannot spell it. Y U R I C. He is a uh, Gomery University of Ukraine, and he was Kaibori. How do you say Kaibori? He, he's a doctor of medicine, medical doctor but only treat the dead bodies. What do they call that? Forensic Okay, that one. That one. <laughs> I don't know the term. But he does that. And after the Chernobyl, he's been doing collecting organs and what uh, nuclear isotopes were in the bodies. Okay? And he found out, his data was shocking, because very little nuclear, like, cesium in the heart was fatal for the people. That's what Yuri Bandachevsky studied. And his study, his uh, thesis were banned, of course. And he had to spend nine years in jail, or seven years in jail. He was arrested for releasing that information. He was the uh, president of the university, medical university of Ukraine, or, U or U uh, Ukraine, or Belarusi, Belarusi. And he's now out of jail, thanks to Amnesty International. I worked on that campaign, too. So he's a great, he was in Japan speaking about it. Anyway, Yuli Bandajewski is another person. You want to study um, how <laughs> bad, well, how, how the radiation affects each organ. It goes into the organs. And we need to eat more and more greens. Yeah, right after the Chernobyl accident, Austrian government made a survey, and they found out 80% of radiation comes through mouth, not from your uh, environment, 20% environment. Food, food. Yeah, food, that means food. So if you are selected, what you eat, uh, that you can you know, protect it pretty much. 
So it's very And this place is a good place to buy product. Lots of organic and lots of you know, good stuff. I shop here a lot. So and also in our medicine, food is your medicine. Okay? And this. Nothing is sterier than this. Because this, this is God creation. It's full of energy. It is holistic energy. It's perfect. It's, it's uh, miraculously balanced. If you try to take out something out of those ingredients, somehow it loses living energy. Yeah. It still works, but I recommend you eat as a whole, as, as living food. That's why we recommend the raw food. So we have to go now. Yeah. <laughs> well, any, 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 any questions? Question? Any question? We, we have question session after Ben's speech. Yeah. yeah, maybe just one. Do they have farms for seaweed? Like, do they make the market the market seaweed you're talking about? Do they farm it? Or like Some places, like, no, is all farmed. Yeah, not in the ocean, but just... Yeah. Like, uh, you know, this spirulina is farmed. Yeah. All of it. So, I think in Hawaii, that this is good. Yeah. And uh, they use uh, deep sea water to grow those, deep sea. Yep. You know, deep sea, they come from like a very deep sea and come out from here, right? And that, that water is not toxic. It's very clean. So I think uh, Spirulina Company has very, you know, bright future, for, hopefully. What about the nori for sushi, though? Nori for sushi? I mean, it's a hard question. I used to use all Japanese and I'm always local, buy local, eat local. <laughs> and now I have to change my thinking, you know, I have to buy maybe Korean or Chinese or, you know, it switches hard, I, I struggle still. Yeah, I'm still struggling. I don't know the answer. Well, it's hard for us when you see these products and you really don't know where they come from. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, in Costco, all you could buy is from Korea now. Yeah, that's they have Yeah, so I am buying that one for now. But we don't know. We don't know what's best. Yeah. We're just trying. We are, you know, somebody said we are all an experiment. This is human experiment. How are we going to survive on this more radioactive environment? That's an experiment, really. But I really want to share the information so that we all survive together. That's my purpose. I want, of course, the kids is my priority. I want all of us to survive in health, in good health. Okay, so we stay in touch and we survive together. Okay. Yes, one question. I have a question. Um, I, I don't really rely on the government to mm -hmm. be healthy. So is there anything, any kind of information out there about um, some sort of tool that we could use to test the fish, the water, the soil, and food on our own? Do you know of anything like that? Well, in Japan, people are paying money by those expensive machines, just matter of money, raise fund to have those machines and to test it ourselves. We, we have to hire some stuff you know, to do the testing. So that's what Japanese people are doing, apart from government. Government does their own testing, but people do their own testing. Yeah, uh, Greenpeace International, they've been monitoring the food in Japan. Greenpeace Japan is doing an amazing job. They're monitoring all the food, especially the fish, and they disclose so many good information, so much good information in Japan for people. So we, all we could do is, if you have interest, you can talk to your friends and have that kind of group, maybe create a non-profit to buy those machines and to monitor. Yeah, we should. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Can I ask you, based on the spirulina question, you were saying that they're taking deep ocean water. Yeah. Is it, is, I read that the radiation density is more intense deeper in the water than higher in the water. Is that it goes in the bottom, yes, but that deep sea goes under seabed. Deep water comes from uh, uh, yeah. Arctic, Arctic to go down the bottom and go, come out, something like that. So it's very clean. They are testing. So I, I have people working there and if when it's radioactive, I, I'm sure I, I hear that. So, so far so good. But in fifth year, which is 2016, I will be really carefully monitoring the food. Five years, radiation will be spreading all over the Pacific. So 2016 is the year you need to be really more and more careful about what to eat. 
So I hope you still stay in touch with me by then, and I'm still alive, I hope. <laughs> okay. Uh, and there's more question after Ben's speech. Do you have to, unless you have to is, go now. Uh, is the radiation still popping into the ocean? Yes. It's still They're trying to prevent, but the, you know, 300 tons a day, and that's a lot of a, uh, a lot of those containers to make. And <laughs> Japan will be filled with those containers soon. Then they have to do, you know, get rid of the water somehow. Yes. Are the people? protesting over there at all? Yes, we are. Because we don't ever hear anything. Every Friday, if you go to in front of Japanese government office, tons of people protesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it doing any good? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> we are protesting, yes. And we're doing lawsuits, all kind of things we're doing, we're doing. But people of Fukushima are more quiet. They are more controlled, more quiet because, and they don't like to hear negative news, kind of, you know, people in Fukushima are more quiet. It's a very sad, sad situation. But yes? Is um, uranium one of the particulates that's coming out of Fukushima? Some, Some people uranium. said yes. Because on the big island, there's been an issue of the of military. Of degraded uranium? The military has yes. munitions, yes. and it's cheaper to shoot the munitions off than to yes. dispose of it properly. Yes. So there's been noticeable amounts of depleted uranium mm -hmm. blowing around. Mm -hmm. It's found in the urine of some people nearby Pohakloa area. Even yes. down in Ocean View, um, there was a nuclear watchdog over here and she was testing levels just in the air when uh -huh. she was here by chance. And um, she picked up high levels. I see. And I so see. I'm wondering, that's one thing to differentiate between yes. the Fukushima yeah. and... It should be, res DU is uranium-238. And this one coming out of uh, uh, Fukushima should be different. I mean, not so high in uranium unless we... And when unit number four collapses, we may have one uranium. Yeah, we may. Now we should be picking up more like cesium, strontium, uh, yeah, iodine. Yeah, so it's bad. All of them really not good either. <laughs> None of them is good. <laughs> Unfortunately. So, uh, one, one good news, we all survived. You're pretty healthy, you know, we're still living. And you're not going to be dying to tomorrow, so we're going to be surviving together. We are pretty strong. We've done 2,000 testing out here in the Pacific. I mean, nuclear testing. And we all survived that. So and you, Hawaii. Has Hawaii. Hawaii is the lowest mortality rate. Yeah, in the United States. Yeah, Hawaii is one of the healthiest state in the United States. Yeah, next to California. In spite of all the nuclear testing in the Pacific. So, you guys are pretty strong, like me too. I'm, I'm a survivor. So, good news. Yes? Somebody from the live stream asked about tritium. Is that something? Tritium. Tritium. Tritium, yes. Is that something to be concerned about? Yes. Oh, yes. Because the experts the are saying are yeah. downplaying that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it should be concerned, yeah. yeah. It goes to anywhere, so tritium is a hydrogen. <laughs> yeah, those are radioactive really uh, materials, and the government refused to, to, to monitor those. So we have to push the government to monitor all those, you know, but those particles. But it's, it's not easy. It, it takes time, and it's more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we have to do it somehow. Yeah. Uh, one, I want Ben to call Ben. Ben, come over here. <laughs> because after Ben speaking, we have more question and answer session. I'd like to start, you know, passing this mic to Ben, because he has more positive news, what we could do about those situations. So thank you very much, Ben, for allowing us to speak. And I have, I have more and more information, but uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is good. Thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. All right, are you guys? Uh, how's everybody feeling? Feeling informed? Bill. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Not informed. laughs> You're strong. We all survivors. Yeah, we're, we're gonna make it. So, um, let's see. Um, I'm gonna talk about the sort of the way detoxification works in the body from the beginning 
and then we can look at some strategies of how we can focus on uh, uh, bringing that up, ramping it up, and also getting more into the radiation aspect. Um, so the basic phase one, they call cytochrome P450, phase one detoxification, is basically every cell of the body has these enzymes that they call cytochrome P450. And these are basically enzymes that deal with toxins inside the cell and also sometimes outside the cell. Um, these enzymes have like a, the ability to uh, maneuver the electrons of some toxins and also mess with sort of the oxygen components of those things. And they can make them more manageable for the body. They can kind of reduce the oxidative stress that these things are causing. Then as they become more manageable, we move into phase two detoxification, which involves some really great molecules like glutathione, uh, methyl donors, um, glucuronic acid, things like that. And we can talk about how to bring those up to higher levels in the body. Um, so beginning with glutathione, um, there are some supplements, um, there are um, molecules that help the body to create glutathione. Basically the cysteine amino acid is responsible for giving the body that um, juice that it needs to create glutathione. Uh, one of the main supplements that people take for that is N-acetylcysteine or NAC. You'll see that commonly sold as a supplement. But there's also a sort of a natural way of doing it that you guys might not think of it as totally natural. It involves enemas and uh, particularly coffee enemas. And so this whole thing about the Gerson Clinic, you guys might be familiar with the Gerson Clinic. Very famous for healing stage four cancers and stage cancers using coffee enemas and juicing and some other things. But basically the whole idea of the coffee enema is that uh, the coffee stimulates the liver to put out something like 800% more glutathione, um, which glutathione can then grab radiation and actually pull it out. Um, so that's a big one. Um, and then moving into methyl groups, methyl donors, um, those are very important molecules. We've got all kinds of supplements in that realm. MSM, you guys might be familiar with, um, for joints and bones and things like that. That's a methyl sulfonylmethane, so that's a methyl group. If you mix that with a vitamin C botanical, you can kind of gently detox the body using, um, we actually have that here, like this, common common. So this is a raw plant, and it has in a quarter teaspoon, 220% of your daily value of vitamin C. There's a few others like that. There's amla, um, acerola, uh, these really high vitamin C botanical plants. Um, of course, great for the immune system, but also when you mix it with something like MSM, which your body produces this naturally. This is found naturally in plants. This is an extract of it. Um, you can achieve sort of that methyl detoxification or increase that. Over time, when we have eaten more and more cooked foods in our diet, we actually lose methyl groups in our cells. We lose methylation, the ability to methylate toxins out. Um, the other thing involved with uh, the cytochrome P450 and this whole cooked food notion is that cytochrome P450 enzymes are found not just in uh, humans, but also in animals and plants. So as we find those in plants, we're, when we're cooking things over 118 degrees, we're actually eliminating those cytochrome P450 enzymes that are in plants. So that's something that we can ingest in basically almost every plant if we don't cook it to that temperature. And that's not to say that some things won't be more bi bioavailable, like broccoli, if you, you know, lightly steam that, or you have to juice it or something like that because it's so fibrous. But we look for the plants that are a little bit, you know, more easier um, on the, you know, the digestion in the raw form, like cabbage. So a cabbage is like kind of a cousin of broccoli. They're both in the same family, in the brassica cruciferous vegetable family. Um, and they both contain molecules that um, have to do with this phase two detoxification. We're talking about glucuronic acid. Um, cruciferous vegetables have calcium d glucurate which is a, a glucurate donor, basically. It helps remove to toxins like radiation. There's actually 
If you look into um, scientific literature on calcium glucograde, you'll find studies that were done on eliminating radiation with that. Another molecule, indole 3 carbonyl another molecule, DIM, D-I-M. Um, you can actually find supplements that have those three things combined. And then we also have the sulforaphanes, which are anti-carcinogenic, also detoxifying. And those are all found in cruciferous vegetables. Um, in addition to that, you can really help achieve overall wellness with cruciferous vegetables. Um, because we live in such a toxic environment we're dealing with not just radiation, of course, but a whole list of other things. I mean, we've got, you know, uh, pesticides, um, GMOs, we've got um, heavy metals. Um, so all these type of things, a lot of them accumulate in the form of bad estrogen. We call bad estrogen, you know, maybe people aren't familiar with it, there's different types of estrogen. Some estrogens you want, some estrogens you really don't want. So there's estradiol, there's estrone, there's estriol, there's progesterone. Those are kind of like the big ones that we're looking at. If you have estradiol in elevated amounts when, say, you're like, you know, 12 years old and you're a woman, you're going to be growing breasts, you're going to be, you know, developing your ovaries and, you know, your reproductive organs and whatnot. But if these things are coming on strong when you're older, when you're going through menopause, say, and you feel, and you have a major imbalance, you can start growing a body part where there already is one. They call that generally a tumor or a cancer, a breast cancer, an ovarian cancer. And so these toxins are now in the field of functional medicine being related to breast cancer, to ovarian cancer, to prostate cancer, to testicular cancer, as causing hormone imbalances. And there are institutes like at Hippocrates Health Institute where they actually deal with uh, they address breast cancer as a hormone imbalance. And they have great results doing that. Um, you'll see information coming from Dr. George Yu, Y-U. That's uh, one of the great hormone experts of the world. And they're doing a study at Hippocrates with him on the breast cancer and how to balance the hormones to get to um, you know, eliminate the breast cancer. So these toxins are connected with general hormonal imbalances, with endocrine system imbalances. Um, these types of foods, like cruciferous vegetables, are going to help pull some of those bad estrogens out. Or you can get the extract form, like I was saying. You can go get calcium, degrade, DIM, and um, uh, indole 3 carbonyl all together. And just, you know, if you really need to take it in a concentrated form. And then it's also about bringing balance to the endocrine system, bringing balance to your hormone system um, using foods like maca. Um, Health Force is a great company, by the way. They're really um, crucial about testing all their products for toxicity or for any kind of um, contaminants. And um, most of it's raw in the living. Um, let's see, if you're a woman, uh, Tulsi, red raspberry leaf. Those are amazing for keeping your hormones balanced. Teas you can do every day. If you're a man, ginseng. Um, Let's see, where are we at? Okay, so we were talking about phase two detoxification, glutathione, um, the glucuronic acid, and the methyl groups. Um, as far as methyl groups and methyl donors go, the highest plants that have been discovered, or the plants that have been discovered have the highest amount of methyl groups are like beets, basically the highest, so do a lot of beet juice. If you do too much at once, you can release too many toxins at once. People have been known to pass out, even have heart attacks, drinking too much bee juice at one time. Yeah, you can, um, if you're going to do like a juicing regimen like that and you want to do those bee juices, really good to have the colon cleaned out because if things are trying to, your liver is basically going to be dumping toxins into your intestinal tract. <coughs> if you don't have a clear pathway for it to get out, it can recirculate in the intestinal tract. So that's why enemas are, again, very important. What's really crucial about the coffee enema is when you do that coffee enema, if you're you know, laying on your side, and on your right side, and you're holding it for 15 minutes, and it's basically running through your liver, your blood's gone through your liver about four or five times in those 15 minutes. So your blood is dropping off toxins as your liver's getting all that glutathione production ramped up, and then it's dumping 
back into the enema and basically so when you release the enema you're just basically sending it right out there and there's a lot of things we can put into enemas you you can put um wheatgrass is a famous one um uh, blue green algae is another famous one prebiotics like noni really good put it in there um prebiotics something that probiotics feed on i think we're gonna get into probiotics here pretty soon and um yeah, so with blue green algae, we can move into spirulina and chlorella. There's um, a lot of scientific literature on spirulina and chlorella specifically to radiation. Um, apparently, they were used in Chernobyl, especially with children. There were studies done there on that. Um, spirulina apparently has a rapid action of removing uh, radiation, especially for people that have like radiation sickness, like they've definitely been poisoned by radiation. Um, they do really high doses, like four grams a day of spirulina, which is a lot. That's like, this whole bottle is, okay, 454 grams. So yeah, it's like, you know, one-tenth of this bottle or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, about four grams a day of spirulina. And then, you know, spirulina is just good for your overall health. So it's the phycocyanin molecule in spirulina that's helping to remove that radiation, phycocyanin, P-H-Y-C-O-C-Y-A-N-I-N. -N. Um, that's also been implicated as a molecule that promotes the growth of stem cells in the body. So if we're looking to create certain types of cells, like immune cells, maybe you'd mix your spirulina that has the phycocyanin with the common common and echinacea, astragalus. Those are two herbs that boost your thymus that Ken was talking about. They have thymus regenerative qualities. Um, we can kind of dial it in that way. If we're like, okay, we want to create cells, let's go with the phycocyanin to get some kind of cell production going. <laughs> and then let's angle it towards maybe immune cells or endocrine system with maca, and you can mix all that and put it into a smoothie. Have a nice little smoothie like that. Um, as far as the thymus goes, uh, some um, strategies of protecting the thymus is actually to wear pendants, like crystal pendants, um, like our rose quartz. Because a lot of times we're on the computer, we're doing, you know, got EMF exposure, electromagnetic frequency radiation. That's actually bogging down the thymus. The thymus can actually shrink and shrivel up in a lot of cases. Um, so as you're doing your astragalus and your echinacea in the form of either tinctures or in tea, you can also protect it with some kind of pendant right there. Um, all right, so we're moving into zeolite and boron. And those were sprayed on Chernobyl. Um, zeolite's a natural clay. Um, boron's a natural element. Uh, you can get both of those in supplemental forms. Um, Health Force has a really great zeolite. We don't have it here though, but that's the one that I'm the most familiar with. And on top of that with zeolite, you also get the chelation of heavy metals and other toxins as well. Uh, so that's a really nice one. Some people prefer the liquid zeolite. There's the zeolite NCD, Natural Cellular Defense. You can try that. I think the powders, you get more bang for your buck. Um, although it's been said that the powder tends to have more action in the gut. Donna is our health force rep here, and uh, she signed you in today. Oh, she's also repping for OGO. That's a spirulina, um, and she'll have more zeolite this week. There are many uses for zeolite, just like bentonite clay. You take a bentonite clay bath, take a zeolite clay bath, similar. Uh, native cultures throughout the world have ingested clay for you know, ages. Um, so clay is kind of a common thing for pulling toxins out of the body. Uh, all right, baking soda, Epsom salt. That's the military recommended depleted uranium protocol. Um, you could do that bath, you could make a bath with that and actually um, put the zeolite in there too, or the bentonite, uh, help draw toxins out. Um, 
Baking soda, you can also take internally. It's kind of a good kidney wash. It helps get radiation out of the kidneys. Um, so that's another strategy there. Of course, when you look at baking soda, you want to look for pure sodium bicarbonate. You don't want any aluminum or anything else in there. Just pure sodium bicarbonate. And generally, the big arm and hammer, and that's what it has. And I use baking soda to brush my teeth. I mix it with essential oils and coconut oil, brush my teeth with that. Uh, do a little whitening with that. And then um, I use it in my laundry, the laundry soap. And you just scrub down countertops. So it's a good non-toxic cleaner. And then as we get into that, with cleaning products, you know, we're, we're generally trying to protect ourselves from radiation by staying non-toxic in general. We want to get all the toxins out so that our body has the strongest defense, right? Um, so eliminating toxic cleaning, household cleaning products is very important. Yes. Beauty products, um, you know, all these types of, you know, when you're like doing your Windex or whatever it is, you know, those are toxins that you're inhaling unless you're wearing a mask. But even then, it's still off-gassing. Um, plastic is a big one, you know, drinking out of a, a glass water bottle rather than a plastic water bottle. If you buy a plastic water bottle to drink out of, Chances are that plastic water bottle company blew that plastic bottle and instead of letting it off gas for a year, how quickly do you think they filled that up with water? Right away. They might have even cooled it that way a little bit. Might have been warm. That's plastic. You're drinking plastic tea. That's what we call that. So definitely want to stay off of the plastic tea. Um, incidentally, uh, I just want to tell the story real quick. They went, there was a study done where they went to, um, uh, I always mix the name up, I want to say Siberia, but it's not, it's Mongolia. Deep, deep, deep away from any civilization in Mongolia, out in the forest, and they found polar bears that had BPA in them and in their placental cord even. So what does that mean? That means that it's everywhere. It's in our atmosphere. We have toxins everywhere. So we're really in the age of detoxification. We are pretty strong. <laughs> if we want to survive. That's what we have to do now. We are strong. Thanks, Yumi. Um, no, it's, it's amazing that we've endured so much toxicity in our lives. I mean, I grew up eating McDonald's and drinking tons of alcohol and doing drugs and everything else. So, you know, I'm still here, barely, but I'm here. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mike, you remember those days, huh? Mike, what it was. <laughs> um, all right. Okay, so we talked about indole 3 carbonyl and cruciferous vegetables. Oh. I'm sorry, I skipped. Probiotics, fermented foods, miso, sauerkraut, kombucha. And Yumi touched on that. Basically, probiotics are gobbling up toxins and they're helping to detoxify the body. That, Like she was saying, not all forms of miso are the real deal. They're not all probiotic forms of miso. Um, you want to look for the unheated, the raw, the organic. There's a good one that they carry down here from Miso Masters. And if you have you know, an issue with soy, they make a chickpea. Based miso also. I'd be doing so miso for, workshop. Oh, yeah, so you're just gonna give a miso yeah, workshop. Make your own miso. It's easy, easy. So That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. So we'll look forward to that. Maybe you guys are on the email list. We'll send yeah, it out yeah. to I you. I send out information if you want to learn how to make miso. Awesome. Yeah. What about natto? Natto, you can make too. That's easy. Yeah, yeah. a natto making good. workshop would be great too. Okay. That's a probiotic. People hate natto. I <laughs> know. <laughs> Natto, Except so. for me, I love it. <laughs> but have you guys ever had natto? Yes. It's yeah. like this slimy, sticky, goopy, fermented <laughs> stuff. Like you have like six feet of slime when you take a spoon out. That's good natto. Yeah, that's that's the stuff you want. That slime is a protective coat of probiotic bacteria. That's the best form of probiotics you can possibly yes. get, actually. Yes. Natto is the highest in vitamin K2 of anything that we know of, or anything that I've seen. 
and um, K2 is a calcium metabolite. So just to process calcium properly, we need K2. It's actually a common deficiency that a lot of people don't know about. Um, K2, other than natto, is really coming from like hard cheeses. And a lot of people don't eat like real, you know, cheese these days anyway. So they're not really getting vitamin K2. So natto is important for that. I, I want to suggest, just in case, if you're uh, the first experience of natto, many people in America don't know how to cook, prepare. Prepare. Natto. Okay, you can buy at the uh, Target, even Target, Target or here. Yeah. Yeah, too. Yeah, it's cheap. First, you put it in the jar or whatever container, you have to stir. Mix. Mix. Hundred Very good. times. Make it white. Hundred mm. times. That's a trick. Okay, so they stir it a hundred times, yeah. their natto. And that's how they prepare it. That's important. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of junk natto out there in the stores, too, right? So you gotta be careful with that, because you know, soy is all GMO now, so you gotta get the organic natto. I actually order from a, a company in California called Megumi. Megumi natto. Megumi natto, yeah, M-E-G-U-M-I. They do organic and it's really nice stuff, and they always ship well. Um, so yeah, sauerkraut. I've been a champion of that for a long time. You guys probably know, been making sauerkraut for a long time. Um, amazing stuff, you know. It's pre-digested food, basically, with probiotic stuff. So you could put your broccoli stems in there, you could yeah. put your beets in there. Um, all the vegetables you want, even the ones that are super fibrous, like carrots, that you might not normally get as much bioavailability. And the sauerkraut kind of breaks it down, makes it pre-digested. So it's just, you're just assimilating nutrients like that. On top of that, you're getting all the probiotics that are helping break down toxins. You're putting that um, sort of acidic probiotic in your gut, what they call the um, lactic acid bacteria, the LAB strains, which is what we want to be populated in our guts. Sauerkraut, very important. Uh, same thing as kimchi. You look forward to it. They actually just started carrying a new one down here, and then I'm starting over at a cafe in Copico Plaza. Um, it's called Coco Island Cafe. It just took over where uh, Upcountry went in there for a little bit and then they moved um, and Coco Island took over and we're going to be making sauerkraut there. We got the crocs in there everything. Maureen supplies us with the best local organic cabbage. Thank you, Maureen. And Adaptations, they've been doing wonderful things for years, giving us local organic produce. Thank you. Um, Okay, so raw foods, what's the whole thing about raw foods? And you know, you heard Yumi talk a little bit about it. You know, you've got these different schools of thought, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, a lot of them saying don't eat raw foods, cook all your foods. Um, Japanese, this, too. Japanese too. Japanese too. So all the science I've seen on it points to about 80% of your diet being raw, being ideal. Um, you know, ideally we'd hit, try to hit 100%, but of course it depends on people's body types, depends on your psychological factors and a few other things. Um, but mainly there's a few things that happen when we cook our foods. We lose enzymes. Once you go over 118 degrees, you lose a lot of the enzymes. Remember the importance of what she was saying about enzymes? Enzymes are the catalyst for chemical reactions that happen between our cells. So we need lots of enzymes. Enzymes help to uh, break down toxins also. Like we were saying before, the cytochrome P450, phase one detoxification enzymes. Um, so we lose enzymes. What else do we lose when we cook food? We lose oxygen. Oxygen's a nutrient. Well, the most important nutrient, actually, in the human body. So we need that oxygen. Um, what else is lost when we cook food? We're losing methyl groups. We're losing phytonutrients even some major nutrients can be lost. Uh, so in some cases, I will cook like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, very lightly at a very low heat. Um, I try to cook everything under 180 degrees if I'm gonna cook food because once you hit 180 degrees in your food or even your water being heated to that degree, um, you, we reach what's called a leukocytosis. That's where your body actually has an immune response to your food. 
your immune system rushes to your digestion. And so constantly playing crying wolf on our immune system when we're eating too many cooked foods, especially if it's cooked over 180. That's why crock pots are really great because you can do this like slow cooking, really low temperature thing and try to stay under that 180. If you stay at a simmer before a boil, you're under 180. So you can make your tea that way too when we do tea. Always try to stay under 180 usually when I cook foods. Um, let's see. Immune support. Okay. So we talked a little bit about this um, with the thymus, with the immune support. Immune support's important for every process that we're going through in the body. If we're going through detoxification of any kind, obviously, you know, if you're sick, you always want to keep your immune system up. Um, something I could actually work on more. Um, the, the medicinal mushrooms like reishi, um, they have um, what we call essential sugars or long chain sugars um, called polysaccharides. So polysaccharides, basically you guys have heard of, you know, the basic sugars, you've heard of, you know, glucose and sucrose and fructose. There's also galactose, mannose, xylose, beta-glucans. Um, these are kind of the long chain sugars, the polysaccharides that are giving intelligence to the immune system. They're kind of like immune weapons. That's what goji berries are really rich in, is beta-glucans, that red color. The same thing on the reishi mushroom, it has that red color, that beta-glucan. It's giving like a weapon to the immune system. Now the immune system, like maybe it only had like um, a knife and the, and the virus had like a gun or something and now it's got like a, you know, a grenade or something like that. So that's kind of like the action of the polysaccharide. Xylose, um, that's xylitol, right? We see that xylitol is metabolized outside of insulin. Um, and it's boosting of the immune system, it kills fungus, it's even got anti-cancer properties, like most of these polysaccharides do. Xylos is naturally found in birch bark, and that's been used in Ayurvedic medicine to cure cancer for quite a long time. So now we come full circle with Western medicine, looking at, oh yeah, you know, we got the xylitol, and it's the extract of the birch bark of the xylos, and we know, you know what it can do. Um, so that's kind of the action there. I talked a little bit about echinacea astragalus already, being thymus regenerators as far as just general immune boosters in general. Um, they also have a number of other functions. Astragalus is um, generally called an adaptogen. Those are herbs that have a non-specific healing quality. They tend to normalize whatever is not normal in the body. Like noni is an adaptogen. Um, we could probably even think of blue-green algae as an adaptogen, I would think. Um, other adaptogens, reishi is an adaptogen. Chaga mushroom is an adaptogen. Uh, I believe goji berries have been classified as an adaptogen for the beta-glucan properties and for some of the other things. They are really high in methyl groups, too. Um, we've got probiotics. We talked about that already. Um, probiotics, the way that they interact in the immune system. So if you're um, using echinacea and astragalus, let's say, it's boosting your thymus activity your thymus is producing immune cells that are then going down into your gut to be sort of educated and sort of taken all. I generally like to do a lot of fermented foods myself. Um, there are products that have it. I don't know if this one in particular, Health Force. Yeah, they are. So they, they use a probiotic process to make this vitamin mineral green, which kind of moves us on to our final part of this, which is minerals. So like what Yumi was talking about with, you know, strontium, cesium, um, and the other radioactive molecules having a different action, some in the muscle, some in the bone, um, these things are, uh, they're taking up residence where minerals are absent. So you need a lot of minerals in our diet. That's kind of like the big finale here, is that minerals are like, like how I was describing that rose quartz, if you're wearing that pendant and you're sitting at a computer and it's blocking some of that EMF radiation, the minerals are like that in your cells where they're like, no, we're not gonna take any radiation today, no. You know, the minerals are kind of like 
pushing it away, like we're not going to do that, we're going to take that in. Um, if you don't have those, the cells are like, oh yeah, we could use some of this, and then they get zapped by radiation. So, um, how do we get minerals in our bodies? Again, what Yumi was saying about spirulino and blue-green algae, one of the highest mineral and trace mineral contents of any known foods, also almost a complete food. It's got almost all the essential fatty acids there, which strengthen your cell walls and your mitochondria and your nucleus. Um, we've got the highest protein source of anything on the planet, actually, up to 60% protein by weight in blue-green algae. That's enormous. That's you know what steak is at 20%. So. Um, this is all here. Huh? No, no. So this isn't sold here at Iowa Naturals. So this is what Donna is repping for. So if you guys want to pick up from OGO or Health Force, which are really great companies, I tried to get Iowa Naturals to bring these in a while back, but I was really happy when I met Donna and found out that she was a rep for both of these guys because they're two of my favorites. Um, so yeah, minerals from blue green algae. Where else are we getting minerals from? We're getting minerals from actually wheatgrass, basic wheatgrass. Wheatgrass if it's in the soil that it's grown in. So if you're growing a flat of wheatgrass and you put a liquid seaweed into your soil, wheatgrass can absorb over 100 minerals in the soil. Grasses in general do that, actually. In fact, what we discovered about grasses most recently in science is amazing. It's like grass is like almost a cure for everything, just basic grass, like broadleaf grasses, B17, laetrile, amygdalin, all these molecules that just kill cancer on contact, but they can't patent that, so you know you won't see that from your um, oncologist. Um, what else has minerals in it? Seaweeds, like she was saying, of course, you know things from the ocean, but we got to be careful with that. So, uh, you know, try to look for third-party tested. Right, that's a really good point. Because seaweed is commonly used in organic farming, natural farming, to mineralize the soil. I have something about um, Okay, Yumi wants to share about that. So in Japan, in Yokushima, they're still farming. And some of the farms, uh, they use effective microorganisms in the, like, they're like fertilizers, you know, EM. So the radioactive soil, the older produces didn't absorb any radiation when they use EM. So there's some pro proven you know, successes with that in Fukushima. So I want to share that. E so EM is a good source and maybe some Korean organic farming, you know, the natural farming by Koreans, they use also micro microorganisms of the local. Yes? Probably can help too, yeah. Probably, but I don't know about that. I, but I, I know about EM. There's a few other things that are similar to zeolite in these clays. That, um, the one that comes to mind is shilajit, uh, S-H-I-L-A-J-I-T, shilajit. That's been used in Ayurvedic medicine for a long time. In fact, it's one of the number one things, and that's got something like over 80 minerals in it. Um, but I think one of the greatest sources is coconut water, because it's just, it's like, it goes straight to your blood, especially if it's fresh. You know, there's a big difference between the stuff in the can that's pasteurized, it's got some kind of leaching plastic or metal molecule in there probably, versus the fresh coconut water. We have coconuts here everywhere, so that's a no-brainer. And it's, it, it tastes good too, right? And it's probably better than algae for a lot of you guys. Um, Any data on Ormus? Oh, Ormus. Well... Yeah, so Ormus stands for or orbitally rearranged molecule, monoatomic. monoatomic. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of like on the fringe. That like mitigates active radioactive particles. Yeah. Oh no, I don't have any. I don't have any data on Ormus effect on radioactive particles. But Ormus is a really interesting idea. If you guys want to look into Ormus, it's kind of like this new science of the periodic table, where basically. They're saying our periodic table might not be complete. Our chemical periodic table, there might be a third dimension to it that we're just discovering that there's 
electrons that are sitting in other dimensions in some type, in some forms of things like gold or silver or copper. And we can actually take in these as supplements. Um, generally, they're, they're shifted when they're oxidized by the atmosphere. So like minerals that are down in the earth might have this different atomic structure, but when they get mined and pulled out, or they get exposed to the atmosphere, it's a different thing. It's, <laughs> it's been uh, theorized that this is what gives spring water its spring, that it pops out because that these molecules are actually have like forces of levity. And like, I, you know, if I go too far into that, I might sound like a crazy person. But, um, it's a fun thing to look at. It's a fun idea. It gives the idea to us that trees are growing against gravity but there's no friction there, that they're using some force of levity, that mushroom spores that actually leave our atmosphere and survive in the vacuum of space, which we know to be true, are concentrating these forces of levity. Yeah. Water springs on mountains where there's high mineral content, gold, platinum, crystal are high in so spring water is one of the most crucial things <laughs> because of that. Um, so, should we do like a little panel with you, me, and Gen? And yeah. you guys want have any more additional questions? You want to ask? All right. <laughs> um, I can direct, so I'm not sure if you guys have talked about it, but have you guys talked about argon energy? Because that's something that I'm really interested in. Like, what are the possibilities of that? Because I know argon is something that's really important. Uh, okay, argon. Do you want? Okay, so argon. I'm not. I'm not like that well versed in it, but I know the basic idea that it's like you take copper and you twine it or you, and then you make a mold around it and it's supposed to have like a vortex effect energetically. All the elements of the universe that you're talking about before are the argon energy. So um, we are testing it in our farm with the pest and we've had great success. Wow, that's amazing. From last year, it was um, about 55% beetle bore in our farm. This year, 2%. Wow, well, I'd like to um, come to your farm and yeah. see what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so she's saying that they're using orgon. Um, I just know that. It's actually pronounced orgon. Orgon, or is it O-R-G-O-N-E? Wilhelm Reich is the one that discovered it. Wilhelm Reich. <laughs> and or organized. I love his profile picture. He's got like this crazy hair. <laughs> He's a mad scientist. Or organized. Organized. <laughs> or cloud busters. Uh, there, there's many different kinds. There's for personal use. There's big ones for big spaces. Awesome. That might help keep some particles away. Right yes. now. radiation that all kinds of Geiger counters. And if you want to test the food, you have you have you need different types of Geiger counter. If you need a I haven't I don't have the name in English and if you have emails down I will find an English name and send it to you. Okay. The way you can order those uh, because our our friends in Japan are buying it yeah. from European companies. So the German one is the best. And Russian one is good. Yeah. I have information on Geiger counters. Geiger counters, yes. So if you want to see me after them. Okay, what's your name? Paul. Paul in the front has a Geiger counter information. Do you have one? I have none. You have none, okay. All right. Um, I have a friend who does the coffee enema every day. So I wonder how, what you have is proper to do it every day. Coffee. So about coffee enemas every day. Okay, so she said she has a friend who does coffee enemas every day, and she wonders what's proper with that. You know, this is advice that um, everyone has to be careful, depending on you know what your condition is, what your body type is. So just look into it a little bit more. You have a. I was going to say, if you look into the Gerson Institute, there's a lot of information about 
Yeah, the Gerson is famous for the coffee enema. So every day is, I'll, I'll tell a little story. So there's a doctor here in town that some of you know, Dr. Baranian, and his cousin, Betsy Heelman, uh, about 10 years ago, was in end-stage cancer. She first had a giant tumor that made her look pregnant. It was um, ovarian. And then uh, she went through chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. Then they said, now you're, you know, now she's a bald skeleton in a wheelchair. Then they tell her she's going to die. And she has a couple weeks to live or less than a month. Go home, see hospice, get your papers in order, all that. She decides to go to the Gerson Clinic. They put her on coffee enemas and juices. I don't know how soon they did the coffee enemas. I don't know the timing of that. But I know that she still, to this day, does coffee enemas every day. And she's like doing yoga and she's like happier and healthier. She's stronger than me. Um, so, you know, she was going to die and now she's still alive from those coffee enemas, from that juicing. Um, so yeah, some people, the coffee in them can work every day, maybe everyone, I don't know. But I would guess that, you know, people have caffeine sensitivities or some kind of condition where they have to be concerned about caffeine, you might want to look into that being a problematic thing. Do we have a source for the Gerson Clinic and Hawaii? A uh, source for seaweed in Hawaii that's like from here? Yeah, is anyone doing it commercially? No, I don't know of anyone doing it commercially. Know. Except, you know, you always see like in KTA, you know what I mean? You'll see like somebody's gone and picked Bimu and there's... Oh, right. Every once in a while, I don't know about recently, I haven't looked into it, but... Sometimes I'll go down to the rocks and just nibble. You know? <laughs> like a turtle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can get good, good deal at Costco. Those are from Korea. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, the fresh seaweeds are from Korea. Okay. Again, it says they're from Korea. Has there actually been any testing done on the seaweeds to see the radiation levels? Because I've heard some information that the seaweed, similar to mushrooms, doesn't take it in, but when you ingest it, it you know gives your body the proper minerals to not take radiation in mm. as well. Like seaweed has a natural block against radiation, possibly. I've heard, but I've, I've heard. Yeah, that would be great news. I don't. Do you have any information on that? Well, at least you know, so many people survived on that. You know, by eating seaweed every day. You know, those people survived. We don't know how polluted. You know, the seaweed also accumulate radiation. So, so we really have to know if it's clean or not. And I'm still searching where the clean seaweed is. It's very hard to find those days. Maybe South Africa, South America, South Africa, and uh, Australia. Like New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. Flatterrap, which is a very clean. Okay, New Zealand. Is it possible to get it here? I was thinking it's starting to import. That would be good. Okay, so sea rashani. If you want clean New Zealand made seaweed, sea rashani, over there. I'd also, I'd also like to mention, um, since Rashani just stood up, Rashani, you're giving a workshop tomorrow. Rashani is like an internationally known, amazing with mental and emotional things. This is something that I should have mentioned that I didn't, but it's just as important as all the physical things we do. If we're stressing out constantly, and we, you know, have this mental, emotional turmoil, that's gonna, you know, bog our health down and make us more susceptible to things like radiation. Yes. So, what she's doing is very important. She's very successful. She's very well known internationally. Um, tomorrow, if you want to go see Rashani. Or you can go to Rashani.com. Yeah. And she makes those wonderful cards that you see down there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That I has like <laughs> quotes from Rumi and all that wonderful stuff and yeah. quotes from Rashani. Um, any? Randall. Well, I would like to mention that there are herbs that can be grown here that are Hawaiian. Number one is turmeric, Olena. All right, that was a good one. Absolutely studied, scientifically designed studies to prove that people who have had radiation therapy for cancer, they've taken in tumors of the melanoma, and it not only has helped them to overcome the effect of the radiation, but also has been, uh, it, it's, it remediates 
the damaged tissue. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that turmeric, turmeric is, is wonderful. I would suggest that anybody who lives on this island, <coughs> turmeric is one of the yeah. easiest yeah. things that you could possibly grow. Mm -hmm. Grow as much as you can mm -hmm. and consume as much as you can. It's wonderful. The other one I want to talk about is rosemary. 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 Yeah, That's doing, that carsonic acid. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of various types of studies with rosemary. Rosemary is something that they've, they've done scientific studies 3.3 times more powerful than any other herb on the planet for use for, radi for gamma radiation. Wonderful. Wonderful. So turmeric and rosemary. rosemary. Is what Randall's talking about. Yeah, um, I want to mention turmeric is also in that class of adaptogens. It's a, got a non-specific cure-all quality to it. Um, rosemary has been used in a long time for antibacterial, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, um, all kinds of amazing properties there. And we can grow those, so that's really good news. And then the carsonic acid in rosemary specifically as something that helps stop the oxidation process that. Um, radiation causes to cells. It actually goes into the fat cells. And that's oh, right. And it's fat soluble. Yes, and that's where gamma radiation likes to store itself. So, as you were saying, if you're exposed to radiation and you are filled up, it's like going to a hotel and the hotel keeper saying, Sorry, no vacancy, not here. Go somewhere else. So, that's an important point is that it, it goes into the fat cells. So those are things to really look into, like, you know, what's water soluble, what's fat soluble, what's alcohol soluble, these various, you know, types of chemical constituents that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention, uh, Randall has helped the uh, Fukushima mother and child when they were here. They, he gave us the like, sprays, and they sprayed to the nose. Do you have those? Yes. I gave them to them. Like a hydrosol? Like, we yeah, spray. Very essential oil hydrosol. Essential oil hydrosol. Yeah, so that's something you want to have and to use to protect yourself. And I also have a new book that's oh, good. Brad Free. So see Randy about that rosemary and tomate. He has very <laughs> wonderful product. Maybe you can buy from him. Yeah. And when I keep inviting Fukushima children to this island, so I really want this island to be like, Pesticide free, and really healing island so that we can have them here and really heal them. So, we need everyone to support each other to make that happen. We are far from that. GMO was good, you know, we are ahead for the GMO, but we had too much, too much Monsanto spraying every day, you know, even my, my neighbors, you know, they kindly come to my yard and try to spray Monsanto. Um, Roundup, oh, your 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 garden is overgrowing. You know, we want that way, but they, you know, they think it's dirty. So that's we have big, long tasks, challenges. We do, but um, we need to keep this island really clean and beautiful and natural. And we need all of us to work together on that, so that we can keep inviting the children from Fukushima to here. Our our county spray is probably the most Roundup. In the sides of the roads. Yeah. So that's something we can at least push the county to stop doing right yeah. away. You know, email your county council members. We have a good county council. We passed an anti GMO bill, you know, and then we have a good mayor that signed it. And he also made a big statement about natural farming. Um, so that's huge. So right now is a really good time that we have to take action and push our legislators to create legislation to ban pesticides. We've got the studies on it. There's, you know, hundreds of studies you can print off the internet that's in the scientific literature that show the carcinogenic effects of pesticides, the non-cancer effects of pesticides, other diseases that they're causing, like diabetes, heart disease, all kinds of other things, um, you know, uh, birth defects, on and on. So, you know, uh, we can really turn this island, like you were saying, into a safe place for everyone. On the other side of that, we have to promote the natural farming and the non-spray farming agriculture like what Maureen's done is she's um, created distributorship for non-sprayed, locally grown produce. You can get a CSA box through them. You're probably eating a lot of the stuff they're distributing already and don't realize it because they distribute to many of the stores and the resorts and or restaurants and places like that. So. Um, that's another way that we go out and seek out 
locally, these grown things. Then we can start really focusing on growing the superfoods and the super herbs like Randall's talking about and create you know, a worldwide international market for that. Um, there's all kinds of internet media strategies we can use for that. People will come here from all around the world. You can have healing retreats, all kinds of things. Especially, like Yumi had said, the radiation basically misses us, right? It, it kind of swings around and they barely, we just get like a little bit of it. So we can really be a safe place in the world in general. Um, One of the safest places. Yeah. And that, yeah, and I was just curious too, um, how about, you know how the uh, spirulina, Hawaiian spirulina, they're going so deep down uh, into the water. Does radiation sink? Yes. I mean, yeah, somebody asked that question earlier. Yeah. Does the radiation oh, sink down I mean, into the from, deep? Than that. So the radioactive materials are heavier than most of the, so it goes down to the bottom of the ocean. So I, I'm telling Japanese people not to eat bottom fish and crumbs and things like that. And, you know, but this deep sea water, as I understand it, come from the below seabed and coming out. It's like spring water in the under the seabed coming out. So that one is still clean, fortunately. Uh, as of today. I don't know in two years or five years. We don't know yet. Yeah. We need to keep monitoring. Yeah. So I will be really careful from 2015, 2016 about seafood, all the seafood from here. I'll be really checking and decide if I eat or not or drink. Uh, or swim in the ocean. One of the things about the health force, algae um, like, that's used in this vitamin oil green and whatnot, they're grown indoors, so they basically create a sterile environment to keep out any contaminants. Um, so that's something to look at is algae that are grown indoors. Um, Health Force also makes a chlorella, they make a zeolite, they make a spirulina. Um, so definitely... Um, uh, oh, the other thing I want to bring up, Micah, um, I've got, we've got a friend here, Micah Sun Eagle, and he's... He and I are going to team up and give further information on how we can basically um, uh, keep the endocrine system balanced, the nervous system balanced, and uh, keep, keep the hormones balanced. Um, so I just want to introduce Micah here. Um, Micah. We're going to be giving another workshop sometime in the next couple weeks, and we'll email that out to you guys if you'd be interested in that. Randall, and then the lady. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. You, you spoke about our dear friend who does some beautiful workshops in regards to consciousness and clarity and beautiful things, for, especially for women. I wanted to mention that there's a book that's called The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. Oh, Lipton. Bruce Lipton, The and Biology would, of Belief. Yes, and I would uh, recommend that everyone read this book because it also gives your body-mind an approach to how immune we really can be. For Biology this. of Belief by Bruce Lipton. And, uh, this is also science Belief. As well. belief. belief. So basically, it's, it's that's the whole body-mind connection. Micah's going to discuss a lot about that. He's an expert in this field, um, as well as Rashani. He's an expert in that field. Um, the whole idea of what Randall's talking about, epigenetics, that basically our genes aren't, we, they don't control us the way we once thought they did. We, there's actually a lot of environmental factors, a lot of mental, emotional factors that trigger our genes to turn on or off certain genes. So it's really more of, we have 90% control over our genes, whereas before we thought we were controlled by our genes 90% of the time. Um, and that's. Bruce Lipton's kind of like the uh, pioneer into that world. Now there are studies coming out that are saying in epigenetics, if your grandmother or great-grandmother was exposed to pesticides like atrazine, you or your, grand or your child could be born with genetic defects from that exposure that happened then. That's that whole thing with Agent Orange where people were sprayed in Vietnam and their kids were born with leukemia and things like that. Um, and what it's actually, um, what they're finding that these pesticide actions are having on our cells is that they're affecting our methylation, 
we were talking about earlier about methylation and how we get toxins out of the body. So it's affecting our genetic met methylation. So another reason why we need to get rid of pesticides, get them off the planet totally, um, get rid of the chemical companies, Monsanto, Dabi, ASF, Syngenta, DuPont Pioneer, they've poisoned everyone, get rid of them. <laughs> Another, or give them the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Another source yeah. of bleaching also is very important is biomagnetism. 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 Yes, that's that. There's um, only 40 people in the world right now, about 40 people in the world that are doing this. And thank God we have one here. Oh. oh who's that? There's somebody here doing biomagnetism. Is that you? Yes. What's your name? Bernard. Bernard? Yes. Okay. Well, maybe um, you guys want to learn about biomagnetism. Talk to Bernard. He's right there sitting next to Mike. He's in a... Orange guy. Orangish, pinkish shirt. If you want to know about bi biomagnetism, yes. Okay. Great. Um, yes. Okay. Um, so... Um, Dear Dr. Bragg, Bragg's amino acid, yeah. he's written a lot of amazing books about just... Water fasting. Yeah, water fasting. That was something I wanted to bring up about drawing the toxins out with uh, using distilled water, which is super porous, so when we drink it, it, it has all the holes that kind of ch -ch 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 grab onto the toxins and help us to eliminate it. Yeah. And so I was wondering if that was... Yeah, if you want to get really hardcore and do a water fast with distilled water. And it's really not that hard. I'll like sometimes well, cut up one lime or a cut up grapefruit and you squeeze a little bit of that in it with it. And it's like and halfway through the day your body's like, come on, let's do yeah. it. You know? Okay, so for Megan it's not really that hard to do a water fast. Okay. But it's not as hard. I don't know. Not I, well, let me just tell you my experience. Okay. Um, last year I did a seven day water fast with my partner and another couple that we're friends with and the, the three of them were doing pretty good like they were doing yoga and stuff and I could hardly even walk really? so it depends on your body type your toxicity level all that so of how easy it's going to be um, the thing crucially to do if you can do water fast is to do enemas with it because again, you can get all the way to your gut, you can have pulled toxins out of, of all kinds of fat tissues and getting all the way to your gut and then it recirculates and hits you in the brain. Yeah. And so dead. you gotta be careful with that kind of yeah. stuff. But there have been amazing, you know, things like Paul Bragg, who didn't he urinate out like um some oh DDT. After like 20 days, he passed DDT in his yeah. urine, and it smelled so terrible, and it had such a burn that he had it tested and found that it was high amounts of DDT. Wow. As well as a full cup or a third cup of mercury. Right. After five okay, and as well as a third cup of mercury. Um, I like to, you know, use some of the things that attack those, other than just water, like you know, the cruciferous vegetables or the extracts from those or. Um, the uh, zeolites and things like that. There's, um, there's Margaret Machado did a nine day deep sea water fast and it was very effective because she gave people other things. Um, I developed a three day fast on deep sea water as well as other aspects of it because of just as you said, there's a lot of toxins that start to come out that's why you need to, to have an enema to, to pull that out of you. But there are other things that you can take orally to chelate that from your body. And uh, I found that three days, kind of along the lines of uh, 72 hours, Christ uh, came up from the dead. And there's, there's a reason for that, whether, whether, whether you think it's, it's for real or not. Our bodies are cellular bodies. In 72 hours, we can regenerate and rejuvenate just about anything. Right, so, there are really powerful ways to regenerate, rejuvenate, uh, like ayahuasca, for example. Um, <laughs> which immediately, you know, pulls, rips tons of toxins out and spins all your cells into some high vibrational activity. 
Um, but you have to go through that experience to do that. But Randall's on point, I think, with that. And um, the thing about the water fast, though, is if you're going to do a water fast, the whole point is to reach ketosis. So you have to go for at least four, five, six, preferably seven days so that you, your, your body's metabolism switches over and starts metabolizing all the toxins and we go into ketosis. Yeah, yeah. I want to add. Can I say? Yes. So there are many people who just talked about fasting. There are so many ways of fasting. And he said each body type is different. And if you want to know which one is yours, which fasting works for you and what kind of diet helps you to boost your immune, talk to this guy. He's a specialist. I mean, we, your body knows. We have a way to access your body, to get information from your body, which one works for you, and which one is dangerous for you. There's a way. So I'm passing the card so that we can, if you want to know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Because fasting can be very dangerous. I've seen many people who fail, in a way, they fail in the fasting, and that can be very, very dangerous and very uncomfortable experience. So you choose right fasting for you. If you want to do that, talk to Ken. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I like to add that it's very, very important uh, sort of a concept of medicine. We, uh, who are uh, oriental medicine practitioner, we don't generalize all kinds of uh, medicine or uh, modalities or whatever you do for fasting and doing fasting. There is no such thing absolutely good or bad. Okay? There is no such standard because you, each body, and each spirit knows everything. We are God's creation. It's perfect. And there is a laws of life which Western medicine doesn't teach. Life is it, there's a law, it's not going at random. There's a perfect order. Okay? We are the perfect creation in essence. But we just don't follow. We violate the laws of life. Which is there's a mystic power constantly working on you inside, making trying to balance. It's an energy work. It's not the blood pressure, it's not the uh, insulation, uh, insulation you know, order. It's, it's, it's a just a, it's, it's a phenomenon, okay? It's a very superficial thing. We complain the pains, mostly, and the headaches, and the all kinds of you know, troubles. But that's, that's what your body is doing, okay? So in our terms of medicine, there's no such thing as disease or sickness. It's all process of healing. Okay? What we are facing, the most problems we are carrying today is we don't trust our own body. Because our body knows everything. So, uh, in, in, so simply put, I'll, I want you to trust your spiritual and physical sensation. Because constantly your body is telling you spiritually where to go, what to do. So, for instance, for the, in case of uh, water fasting or whatever you do, you just ask yourself, do I feel comfortable doing this? Do I really want to do this? If you feel uncomfortable, immediately stop. Because your body says no. No matter what, you know, prominent doctors or government or whoever authority says, this is the real, you know, this metal that cures many, many millions of people. Don't trust, okay? Trust your own soul message, because constantly it will tell in you. That's all I want to say. So uh, along those lines, I want to tell a little story. Um, in about March of last year, 2013, uh, I got a call from my uncle, who uh, his doctor had had a really bad report for him that he was approaching liver failure and heart failure with en liver enzymes through the roof and LDL cholesterol very elevated. 
um, and they wanted to put him on statin drugs, uh, which is commonly prescribed for that kind of stuff. And my uncle went, got the statins, and went home and looked at the, all the side effects and uh, decided to throw them away and call me. And then uh, I went out there and um, he wanted to do juicing, but he really didn't want to do enemas. But he wanted to try vegetable juicing for a few days, and I told him, you really have to do enemas if you're going to do this. And we started the juicing, and he wouldn't do the enemas. And we got to about day three or four, and he started to have pain in his gut, like, and it got really intense. And I kept telling him, I said, do, do the enema, you'll feel better. And he finally gave in and went and did the enema, and then he was like, enemas every day, and colonics, and like, he loved it. Now he's like, constantly doing enemas and colonics. So, um, six weeks later, we went back to the doctor, had everything tested, and his LDL cholesterol was almost normalized. It was right there around the 200 mark. And his liver enzymes had dropped a full 100 points down into the normal range. Um, so that was basically, he did juicing um, for a few days and then started doing the enemas. Then we put him on the salads and smoothies along with the juicing. He was 100% raw food for about three weeks. Had never done any kind of raw foods before in his life. We did a lot of Chinese herbs, especially shizandra. Uh, we did some chaga. And, um, and then he started introducing like salmon and things that he was comfortable with that I could approve him that were more, you know, closer to clean than just eating like tuna out of a can or, you know, some kind of generic thing like that. Um, but yeah, sometimes, uh, like Dan was saying, we have to, you know, kind of dial it into what's specific to you, what works for what your condition is, you know, it depends on what you're feeling like and what your, you know, mental, emotional capacity is there. It's really important. Because um, we've given you guys a lot of options today. So, you know, go to what you feel really attracted to there. And uh, you have any more questions out here? Pono? I got Pono first. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's okay. I have a question for the whole room. Is anybody testing the water? Is anybody testing the water for, for radiation? radiation? I cannot test. Oh, listen. I asked. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. 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 But um, I know there's a Facebook group, and um, sometimes people come over from Kauai and they're testing. I see. But I think we should test like regularly, yes. like weekly. Yes, I think oh, yeah. so. Uh, um, the Recycle Hawaii okay. has a very, very good diagram. You can test the water? You can test, test the water? You can keep pick up the cesium, yes. gamma ray still, yes. from the water. Yes. Yes. The, even mine can. Yeah. But really testing the water is a, a well, more difficult. Yes. Yeah. 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 But they've been testing. So far, we're good. We are good, yeah. We are pretty good. Hawaii's pretty good still. Is that on a website or? Oh, there's, I, I need to talk to you. Because there's a lot of people from Hawaii. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's not count per minute, mine is megacivet per hour, that's uh, 0 0.05 today. And it's been so for two years now, no change. And mention San Francisco. San Francisco is higher. Yeah, a couple of months ago they are very high, so the air and you know, even the water goes that way and comes here. So they have higher mortality rate for infant mortality, mortality rate, higher in California now than here. So that's something alarming, yeah? And so for babies, and if you're having baby, planning to have baby in your view, or you will have baby some days, you need to be careful, really. You have daughters. Yeah. Um, there, uh, along those lines, there was, um, I saw a video on YouTube posted on uh, Christmas Eve that um, was a guy with a Geiger counter on the beach in San Francisco. Uh -huh. yeah. And when he was in the parking lot, it was like down in the 50s, but then when he got right on the shoreline and jumped up to emergency of over like 120 or something like that. That's count per minute. Count yeah. per minute, yeah. yeah. So it got really high. It's the, the thing started beeping and going off, basically, that it was an alarm. Um, and, it, and then what you were saying about babies, um, I just want to say that it, the men's, because we talk about the importance of girls and women in protecting the, the eggs, um, the, over, the ovaries and whatnot, but with the men, your sperm is just as important um, because if you're toxic, your body's producing it, you know, as is right then, but it's still taking in those toxins. And so we're finding with men is it's just as important for men to detoxify as women before getting pregnant. Um, yes. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> so, you know, we all need to detoxify basically. That's kind of the general message here. Yeah, yeah. And then two things, we can write our county council people and our mayor and ask them to stop spraying Roundup on the side of the road and also ask them to start measuring the radiation, or we might have to do that at the state level. I don't know how that would work, but uh, we should at least make a push for that. Um, I also want to mention that I lived in San Francisco in the late 90s, and it, the water quality was high for that, and also- Water quality was high for radiation? Yes. In the mid-90s in pollution, San Francisco? Okay. And pollution, and, and they determined that the water was causing was a major cause in uh, uh, what was it seven out of ten women getting breast cancer. Yeah. Wow. So it's been a that's been a major area mm -hmm. for a while even before you know Fukushima. So mm -hmm. I mean, lots of nuclear facilities, <laughs> nuclear facilities. You know. Yes. Probably, yes. Probably. Um, yes. And and military also. Ladies, yeah. I so we. I won't say you know all of us. Our body. This is the miniature Earth. Mm -hmm. Your body is miniature Earth, and you really clean. You you watch what you drink, eat, put your or even shampoos and cosmetics. Make everything natural, organic, and local if possible. Then you will be really working for Mother Earth. You'll be creating the beauty on Earth by making yourself beautiful. We, we are together, you know, me, my body and my Earth, you know, my Hawaii is the same thing, you know. If I start using chemical salt and, uh, you know, those cheap shampoos or cosmetics that eat junk food, you know, what come out of me is polluted and I'm polluting the Hawaii. So, you can really making yourself beautiful, that's how you keep Hawaii beautiful and planet Earth. So each one of us can contribute. So be, stay healthy, really. Optimum health, do best you can to feed, what to feed your child. You know, they don't like, you know, my kids do not eat this, they don't like that. But keep trying, you know, feed them well, feed them with good food so that we are not polluting the planet. We, we make ourselves strong together with the Earth. It's the same thing. That's what I want to say. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify, you'll see a lot of slick marketing towards this idea. If you go down to the aisles even here, um, you'll see like natural or even organic sometimes. And it's like body products and things like that. And then you look and there's like all kinds of chemicals and things in it. Even like Burt's Bees. 
you know, they were like famous for a long time for being this natural thing. If you look at it, there's just all kinds of stuff in there. Because they were um, bought out. They were bought out. Yeah. So, um, I just go straight to like basic ingredients. I like to use like essential oils for my body. I like to use, you know, pure sodium bicarbonate to brush my teeth. Um, as my laundry soap, I'll put sodium bicarbonate in essential oils. Like, it's pretty basic. And now actually people tell me I smell better than I used to. <laughs> uh, so. You're clean now. You, you know, I, you, it's, if it's not edible, you cannot put it on your skin. Okay, skin observes. It goes directly into your body, bloodstream. Yeah. If you eat it, it goes through, you know, detox system, like my spleen working, my liver working, you know, to detoxify. But if you put on the skin, or hair, or there, even the woman's product, that's really toxic. Yeah. Okay, so don't use those. The only things you can eat, edible thing on your hair or skin or, you know, I use olive oil or coconut oil yes. on my skin or... Coconut oil. Yeah, oil. Um, that's it. We Everything edible should be the cosmetics. Yes. Uh, and shampoo and cleaning, everything. Um, that's absolutely true. If it comes, if toxins come in through the skin, they're not getting processed by the liver, by the natural detoxifying <coughs> parts of the body, so... And spleen. It's, yeah. Minus. And spleen. No, no, yeah. It's, it's going straight into your fat cells or straight into your blood or wherever, you know, into your brain. You know, you're putting the, sh the baby shampoo on the baby's head and Johnson & Johnson, mm -hmm. look at what's in there. It's going right in there, especially the soft skull, you know. You know what the Hawaiians used to do in ancient times was they would mash sweet potato and put that on the baby's soft part of their skull after they were born and let that absorb the, those nutrients and that mana, that energy. Uh -huh. Self part of the skull. Um, we, we do that. So, uh, yeah, we do that. Oh, you guys do that too? Uh, not sweet potato. Uh, like taro. Oh, they're, they're using taro to do that. Taro. Yeah. So. Huh. Have you seen this? Yes. Yeah. And you want to Anybody has seen this? I want to pass this out. This was uh, December 29th. And this is the uh, uh, Fukushima kids who are here. We invited them, uh, eight of them. And they were front page of West Hawaii Today. I really want to thank West Hawaii Today to cover this event. We had an uh, amazing time. And thank you, many of you who had made it happen to support us. But we keep having those kids coming over. So I have this um, badges made. This is made by Fukushima people to fundraise. So, say yes to nuclear free, it says, yeah? I, I created this yes button instead of no buttons, no nuke. I said, I don't want to say no, I want to say yes. So, yes, nuclear free. So, those buttons are here. If you want to help support Fukushima kids to keep coming here to heal, please help us out, yeah? Did you want to say something about the ocean thermal energy? Oh, yes. They went to Nelha and saw the presentation of Alltech. OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, and they're going to be uh, making a bigger plan this year, actually, and they need more funding. And OTEC is something, anybody knows about OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion? I think they have big future now, really. It's not, it's clean, and it, oh, Hawaii is I ideal for that, and there's only two plants operating or having uh, two plants in the world, here in Hawaii, you know, one in Japan, Kumejima, only two. And they're going to be going ahead with a Jisho plant, or what you know? Proof plant, yeah, this year, and uh, they're going to be making 100 megawatt or something. So we, it's really possible for us to go 100% renewable natural energy on this island. I, I'm not so keen on the geothermal because of the, some of the, the toxic plant, yeah, but all tech is very doable. It's 24-7. And of course, solar and wind, but they go off at night, so... So, Otek is something I didn't want to... Uh, Fukushima kids were very excited to see that, and because they are suffering from nuclear energy, we should have some new type of energy that is not damaging for future generations. I want to say that, that Hawaii is ahead of the world. All right, thank you. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, if you want any help for us or OGO products, to see Donna um, 
And Micah, do you want to give us like a preview of of what we can expect from the workshop with you, or do you, do, are you prepared for that? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. When you're done. Okay. No more so, questions? So Michael, give us a little preview when we're done. Does anybody have any more questions? Mm -hmm. you... Can I just say something about our CSA? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. This is important. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Maureen with Adaptations, and we uh, have an organic farm in Hono now, and we also have a network of about 30 to 40 family farms that we distribute for each week. So we have a CSA that's online-based, there's a couple different selections, basic, gourmet, and custom made. The custom made allows you to actually shop in the web store online and purchase what you want. Um, it's weekly or bi-weekly, and there's some postcards out of the table. Great. That's fresh produce. Yeah. From local See? farms. Unsprayed. Yes. Unsprayed, fresh produce. Community support agriculture. Yeah. Started beautiful. in Japan. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Started in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Or say they say. Okay, one more please. Yeah. Uh, can the representative speak a little bit about the products that are going to be available? Oh yeah, Donna, do you want to? Nathan, just putting people uh, on the spot. I, I want to say one, one thing. No, no, she's great. No. And actually we have workshops coming up with Donna in the future too. She's going to teach Three. about raw desserts. This is the one I she makes take amazing. to Japan. Oh, oh. Oh, this beautiful. is the one I take to Japan. Oh. Blue, blue, blue green algae. So that's when what... I go to toxic place, <laughs> To protect myself, I I take blue green algae and I take my raw chocolate. Raw, um, it's made of, with raw cacao and uh, dates and some nuts and fermented seeds. So I I do chocolate workshops. You want to learn how to make chocolate? Call me. Also, you know you have green card. If you want to eat a seven days straight, hundred percent raw food every day, call me. I do that. Too. Now just to put a little plug in with chocolate. The theobroma is part of the coffee enema that's stimulating the glutathione production we were talking about earlier. So cacao is also in that realm of helping to stimulate glutathione. It's also one of the greatest antioxidants and it has molecules like anandamide that are known as the bliss molecule. But anyway, um, Donna makes great raw food desserts also and um, we're, we hope to have a workshop with her um, demoing that and giving us tastings of that in the future. And, um, please let us know about these products. Hi, I'm Donna. I've been selling the, um, the, the um, Health Force products and the Ultimate Superfood products for a few years because um, I used to use them and really, really like them. I do the vitamin green every single day. It's got every green you could think of and it's got the probiotics. It's got wheatgrass. Mineral. Yeah. Mineral. Yeah, minerals. And um, I work out a lot. I'm a personal trainer and stuff, so it gives me really good energy. I feel really good when I take it. So that's one of my favorite things. But also, I'm going to have that for sale in the maca and the chlorella and the spirulina. I have powders and tablets, and it's all raw. Um, unfortunately, all my product didn't come in, so I will take a list if there's something you want. I have a list of the products and the prices, and you just put down your name and number, and I'll let you know when it comes in next week. And if it, and if, it, if we need more, I can make more orders. So uh, there's those things. I also have a big um, uh, cleanse over here that's like a 14 day cleanse from Health Force. Probably the best cleanse I've ever done. It's really good. So and, um, this this has an intestinal drawing formula in it that has zeolite and activated charcoal so what that's going to do is like if you're on a water fast or you're on a juice fast or you're doing any kind of cleansing if you're pushing uh, toxins out that intestinal drawing formula is going to capture them in the intestinal tract it's also going to just help cleanse your intestinal tract in general so this is a crucial like safer. Yeah. yeah it makes it a lot safer it's got the vitamin oil cream in it. Um, can you tell us how long you've been a raw foodist and a vegan plant-based diet? Sure. I've been vegan for 23 years. Um, I've been raw for probably five years. Um, I just feel really good. I always have a lot of energy. How old are you? I am going to be 40 <laughs> on my next birthday this spring. So, yeah, so my kids are also vegan and, um, and they do really well. So um, I definitely 
promote the raw diet and I'm um, looking forward to doing the workshops. So if you have any questions, please feel free to talk to me afterwards. Thanks. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you where your chlorella is from. Where? It's the ultimate superfoods, you mean what the source, where exactly it's coming from. Uh, I, ben said that they, like he said, they the grow it. The yeah, so they grow it on their own. The chlorella. In the United States, That, right? that Health Force has the, the chlorella vulgaris strain. The, the chlorella that Health Force has, the chlorella vulgaris variety, is the one that's grown indoors. I haven't looked into the OGO source. of I haven't researched that one particularly, but they do really high quality in general. So um, I, I would feel really good about taking that. Uh, but the Health Force ones that she's, you're going to get those in too, right? Yep. Yeah, so that one I have researched. That's the enclosed one. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, did you have a question? Yeah, how the prices versus buying through you versus maybe a health food store? Oh, prices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Typically, I, I try to sell them cheaper than you would online or in the health food store, which they don't sell in any of the health food stores here, so I'm pretty much your only, your only rep on that. Oh, I see. You're the only one. <laughs> I can sell it for whatever I want. No, I'm just <laughs> no, I try to keep the prices low, and then tax and everything's included, so it's just a set price, and that's it. Okay. All right. Hey. Anything else? So he wants to keep it. He wants to keep it complete. Make sure you listen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you haven't signed in your email and you want, you know, further emails about events that we're putting on, please put your email out down. You can get news from getting you me, news from me. We won't give you any spam or anything else, but just relevant stuff. I also want to give you all the source of information in English, that which you can also Google and find yourself, other than here for me, because I always... Uh, my, my language is Japanese. I'm always sending information for Japanese people. So these fair winds energy education, they have me somehow, fair winds energy education, and Arnie Gunderson, this is a good person to trust about this, any nuclear... <coughs> Arnie Gunderson used to be the chief of uh, GE, General Electric, and he's, he created nuclear power plants. Nuclear engineer, he designed, he's a designer. And he found there's a fault that there is some mistake in the designing and defect. And uh, he, you know, taught, he became whistleblower because GE didn't listen to him. And also, Three Mile Island accident, he was there. He was still the GE engineer then, and the company didn't disclose the information. Then he quit and he. He spoke about what's going on in Three Mile Island. So that's Arnie Gunderson. Beyond the nuclear, the citizen groups also they give out very good information. Beyond the nuclear, you can Google that. Eon stand for uh, Ecology Option Network. Eon, they are pretty good. They have online YouTube videos on you know, on a lot of a lot of stuff we talked about today. And uh, the person you want to follow is like Kakuo Kaku Michio. He's, he lives in New York. Helen Caldicott, I work with her. She is a good uh, source of information on the health. And oh, also Radnet. Radnet is a radiation net. Radnet and also another one called radiationnetwork.com. I'm looking for somebody with good Giga US or USSR, a Giga counter who can monitor Kona, um, Mauka, and Makai. Uh, I'm looking for somebody who does monitoring and send the data to radiationnetwork.com. So I'm looking for that person who can do that. Helen Hart got a pediatrician, so for health, she's, she's the best. That's about it for me. So I, I'm, uh, I know all of them, and I work with them. So my source of information from them and also from Japan. And I just heard there was an under, underground explosion in Fukushima right now. It's a headline in Europe today. Just happened. Yeah, underground explosion. <coughs> we don't know. One, two, three, I'm sure. If it's underground, it must be unit one, two, or three. Most likely three, because three has been emitting lots of radiation lately since uh, the end of the year, till now. 
So there's some action going on in Fukushima. Unit 3. Unit 3 is dangerous because it has plutonium instead of uranium. It's plutonium oxide. So it's kind of a dangerous one and that something is going on right now. You need to be monitoring. So follow me on Twitter. If anything, I will write something in, in English. Okay? So thank you. That's it. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so, thank you so much for organizing them. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Yumi and Gan. Thanks everyone for coming. It's been a great time. I love you guys.